Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we are uh, having some people, our one council member is uh, participating via Zoom. Is she on now? Oops. OK, well, she will be coming on via Zoom. And then those that are going to participate can watch through the city's website, YouTube, and Spectrum Channel 2. Um, so let's do a roll call, please. Councilmember Ariano. Councilmember Larson? Here. Councilmember Nisrati? Here. Councilmember Iscare? Here. Mayor Bublack? Here. Four of us are here. Um, we'll just do a looking and seeing for declarations of conflicts of interest. Hearing and seeing none of the four of us. Um, we have no closed session until later tonight. And the approval of the agenda is posted or amended. I would ask that we do the budget next since it is the most uh, important thing we do here, I would ask that make a motion to have it be the next item. Move to uh, move the budget presentation up to the first thing on the agenda. A motion? Second. And a second. Clerk of the roll, please. Approving the agenda as amended. Council Member Ariano? Council Member Larson? Yes. Council Member Nizarati? Yes. Council Member Escare? Yes. Mayor Bublack? Yes. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and move to the, uh, the budget. We're going to do budget first, and then it'll be next. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the uh, finance staff will join us here shortly. They were not anticipating this item being the first item on the agenda, so they'll come up to uh, uh, do the presentation. But uh, as uh, we're getting here, I'll give you kind of the overview of uh, where we're at on the budget uh, as it's being presented this evening. As the council knows, um, my first budget being presented to, to the council uh, was ripe with some challenges this year. Um, as we put this document together over the course of the last couple months, uh, the world has continued to change on us. So um, this is no different in the time frame that has elapsed in the last month since our last conversation about the budget from May 26th to what is being presented this evening, um, tonight being June 23rd. So. A uh, couple things to note which significantly changed the budget from uh, what was presented in a draft form uh, on May 26th is the CARES funding. So uh, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act was passed um, by, it was signed into law in on uh, March 27th, 2020, which $2 trillion, yes, with a T, lots of zeros, uh, was approved to allocate funds to local governments and across the uh, the country. The Stanislaus County, having a population over 500,000, received $96.1 million of CARES funding. On June 9th, uh, the County Board of Supervisors took action to allocate 30 million of that 96 million uh, towards what they commu considered community activities, um, broken into two pots of money. So $15 million to go to uh, businesses under a new, um, shall we say, stimulus program, uh, one that they did similarly earlier this year. Uh, they will be rolling that program out shortly. The other $15 million they allocated to the cities on a population basis. So for the city of Turlock, uh, that yields a little over $2.5 million. So with that allocation on June 9th, um, that allowed us to look at those revenues um, to see if that had an opportunity of assisting our budget and thankfully uh, makes a pretty significant difference on how the budget is presented uh, this evening versus what it was shown um, on uh, May 26th. So there are some concerns with the CARES Act and how those monies uh, can be allocated. Uh, as they exist today under the guidance of the CARES Act, there are um, uh, provisions for it being spent specifically for uh, direct and indirect expenses relative to the uh, COVID-19 response. Um, we've continued to work with Stanislaus County. They passed an item today, their Board of Supervisors, um, to provide for the agreement um, for how these monies would come from the county to the city. 
So no, the, under the terms of that agreement, um, we would present a tentative spending plan of how we would allocate those monies between March 15th and December 30th of 2020. And then they would give us the money, that agreement we agree to provide um, support and uh, documentation to pass the single audit requirements that are put in place by the federal government to ensure that those monies are expended appropriately. Um, there are some risks associated with being able to find, you know, two and a half million dollars worth of expenditures relative to uh, the CARES uh, expenditure. However, um, there's a couple things that are still pending out there, one of which would be a legislation change that would allow CARES money to be used for revenue loss. If that were to occur, um, that would create a significant flexibility with uh, how we applied those monies. But as it exists today, we're very confident um, in being able to identify expenditures in that one and a half million range. Getting to the two and a half million range might be a little more challenging, but um, we're continuing to pour through those guidance and guidelines and working with all of our partners on what everyone else is doing to be able to meet those uh, requirements. So um, the budget that is presented, and Nadine will go through the details, but uh, does provide for c some cushion in there on the basis of that um, potential concern of not being able to allocate all of those CARES money. Um, so the budget as presented will show a net positive in revenue over the expenses of just over a million dollars based on that concern about CARES monies. So wanted to give that high level perspective. The other thing that we learned um, in essence, yesterday and being flushed out today was the state's budget approval, which has been an interesting process. Um, they are looking to allocate additional state CARES money um, to the cities, and that allocation process is supposed to be rolled out by Friday. Um, initially, Stanislaus County had indicated they were likely going to claw back, i.e. any CARES money we got from the state, they would likely pull back an equal amount of the money they're allocating to us. However, they have walked that back as well. So if we do get additional CARES money from the state, we would likely um, be able to apply that to the response. Now, again, it's the same CARES money, so it has the same um, strings, shall we, shall we say, which has some concerns um, based on what our expenditures are. But there's still lots of talk, and as we've all experienced in the COVID world, it is very fluid. <laughs> it continues to change on a daily or hourly basis. So uh, before I get into or cover any more details, I think it'd be appropriate for uh, Nadine to cover the, the PowerPoint presentation to go through the details of the budget, um, and then we can talk into some more, more of those details. Nadine, um, so before she starts, uh, are there any other changes that the public needs to know about in, in reference to the PowerPoint is different than some of the numbers you have on the stuff that we were provided Friday? So I just wanna make sure we're all Public watching, anybody who's sitting here or Councilman Brariano. Yeah, the information is changes? yeah, the information is the same that's in the budget packet. The PowerPoint uh, information is on the website. Um, folks can pull it up under the that link was shared today as well. And Mayor, I would like to confirm, Councilmember Ariano, you are on the line. Council member. Yes, Arion. I'm here. Very Sorry. good. Thank, no, here. thank you so much. I just wanted to confirm before we started the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nadine, you're up. Good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the public, and staff members. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we'll start out with um, the budget trying to balance it as you can see the first um, area we're looking at is the general fund and we've brought this before you um, in a different um, with different amounts because we've now included all the savings that Toby talked about which does show a general fund budget with a positive balance of a little over a million dollars and we're going to go over what that entails in the coming slides So this breaks it out as um, by classification where salaries are 81% of the general fund and then the other expenses are all under 10% each, um, totaling the $41.8 million of expenses. The non-general fund, we broke it out a little differently to show operations versus capital because sometimes when you look at capital, which are the large projects which go on for over several years, 
Um, it tends to lend itself to looking like the fund is not balanced. Um, operations are an annual um, expense and capital fees are collected from different things like grants and sometimes special funding. And so those will sometimes show negative in a year because of that. So this is the operations, which you can see for fiscal year 2021 does have a positive of 6.2 million for the non-general fund departments. This is where the capital comes in and it does look a little odd, but there are enough fund balance to cover all the capital items. And there is some pending outside finance, I believe with SRWA and things like that. And that's where this falls into. We wanted to highlight where we started um, where, where we ended the workshop at on May 26th and how we got to our numbers here so that people could follow that. The last budget we brought you was almost $4 million negative. And how we changed that was the $2.5 million in the CARES revenue. Um, we rounded that for budget purposes. It's actually just $8,000 over that. Um, and then we have salary savings for mostly frozen positions that are in the general fund. Um, and then some overtime we've cut. And then um, the city manager would be the acting, acting interim municipal services director for the year. And then a portion of his salary would be allocated to that as that position is currently vacant. Um, for fire, you'll see that it says six months of the firefighters' positions. That's because the original budget we proposed back in May already accounted for six months of those vacancies, and the chief was planning at the six-month mark to fill those. Um, as a result of our budget situation, he chose to not fill them for the full year, and that's why you only see six months on this slide, because the other six months were accounted for in the initial workshop. Let's see here. And then we had some insurance savings when we brought the original budget to you. We had estimates, and since then the insurance um, numbers have come in a little better than we thought they'd be, and so there were some savings there. The aquatic programs, it was decided that those were not going to operate because the pools were unavailable, and so there were some savings there. And that's what brought us to the one little over a million dollars of positive general fund balance. Part of that is um, because we have, in 2021, 18 positions in the general fund that we are freezing. In 1920, there were 17 positions that were frozen or held vacant. And those are continuing to be held vacant. And then the 18 you see in 2021 are additional positions. And that's where most of the savings is coming from. As you can see, cumulatively, the savings with salary and benefits is a little over $4 million. And it is 35 positions in the general fund. Of that, it's about 16% of the general fund that we are freezing cumulatively through 2021. So um, my understanding of vacant versus frozen is unfunded. So frozen's unfunded and vacant is? Well, they're all frozen, they were vacant, and we unfunded them and froze them so that they're not spent. So you... So, so am I to understand that we're, we froze any police positions at all? Did we freeze police positions? Correct. I'm asking. Yes, we did. Yeah, the two police officer positions that were one unfunded, one was vacant through last year, that continues this year. Yes. And, and then there are other, the police... Fired? What's that? We froze fire as well? Correct. Yes, there are. And when did we do that? Because the last meeting you, you told us that we had not done any freezing of public safety. So this is showing fiscal year 1920. And what we're showing you is the draft for 2021. So they were frozen. But typically it's the, what happens is uh, us, the policymakers, make that decision, right? And, and so I, I just, so I'm, I'm stuck. I'm kind of shocked that so you're you, talking about frozen. You did make that decision in 1920. That's what we're showing you. And this frozen is, or to hold the position open? I, I don't think we froze so, any public safety. So, frozen 
is a position that does not have an allocation of funding for it for that year or kept vacant. That's same terminology. Hmm. Okay, so, it, so it's just terminology. It's just terminology. I right? asked so. terminology. Is it so? And and we started with this, right? So, frozen means unfunded. Well, Vacant means that it's it's sitting there. It's totally different. So, so I was asking mm -hmm. if that correct. was a so right assumption. Correct. A vacant position has its allocation of funding in the budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. A unfunded or frozen does not. Correct. So, is that correct? Right. I'm just I'm just going to tell you that I thought we ha did not have any frozen public safety. So I, I'm I'm a little bit surprised because I thought we had vacant positions. We. From what I see, we did have frozen positions in 1920 for public safety. We had a records technician, two police officers, and three emergency services dispatchers in 1920 that were frozen. By definition, of they were not funded in the budget. And then in 2021, we have 18 positions that we are uh, requesting to be frozen in order to provide the savings that is needed for the general fund to balance. And those are across the board in different areas as well. Police, fire, which you saw in the, this slide right here. Those are the areas where we are um, requesting that those positions be frozen for savings to the general fund. One of those would include the fire chief as well as the police chief after retirement, that position would be held um, vacant until further notice. It is budgeted for the entire fiscal year. With that, we are bringing you the most updated um, estimate of where the general fund sits based on revenue that we have received, expenses that we have incurred, and where we anticipate the final revenues to come in and the final expenses to land. Um, as you can see, we have increased our reduction of sales tax based on what information our consultant has provided us. Again, that's changing regularly. We've read some articles that April and March were fairly low, but May was better than expected. So we're just not sure where the month's going to end. Um, we've only received sales tax through the end of March. So we still need to receive April, May, and June of sales tax. And we also still need to receive April, May, and June of TOT tax. We're not sure where that's going to be. But we have accounted for losses in both those areas. So with that, we expect to end 1920 at this time in a slight negative of 36000 so it's going to be pretty flat, we think. Um, the biggest factor, of course, is sales tax, and that's probably the most unknown. So this is what we've projected. So there, we're projecting not a savings for 1920, but we'll just have to wait and see. As um, I believe we receive sales tax by the end of this week, we'll know for the month of April. With the estimates and where we are with the um, general fund reserve, we have unassigned at the end of fiscal year 1819 of 8.5 million. In 1920, we anticipate it being just a little over 8 million. More of the committed is in the fund 120 and fund 116. That's why that number does go down. And then for 2021, based on the budget that we have presented you, we expect to see the unassigned at $9 million. With these numbers, the unassigned as a percentage of general fund expense is about 20% across the board. And based on the floor of $6.5 million, we would be at the current fiscal year $1.5 million based on the budget and what we expect to happen. And then for 2021, if that $1 million in the general fund does materialize, it would bring our general fund reserve at the $2.5 million for the unassigned. With that, are there any questions? 
questions for me? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, uh, Toby. Uh, I know that this, there's an assumption that if you kind of keep a status quo budget that it's a little bit easier. You can kind of copy and paste from the from last year, but I know in this case it wasn't. We still had to be very creative with this and ensure that the uh, policy decision from the council of making sure that that reserve is, is continuously being invested right now is our priority, so thank you for that. Um, could you go back to the sales tax page with the, uh, the how we're expecting 36,000? Yeah, I think it was that, was that it? This one? Yeah. So the uh, net income loss without COVID-19. So this is that 36,000, um, that's without the COVID-19 um, uh, potential monies we could be getting. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Or no, I might not be. The COVID-19 revenues yes. that we're expecting to receive? Yes. The 2.5 million? Yes. That is correct because okay. that is budgeted in 2021 and this okay. is 1920. Right, okay. Yes. Right. And as we get clarity, we will likely, um, clarity on how to allocate those monies, we would likely be adjusting the 1920 to reflect those expenditures in 1920 from March through June 30th right. with those CARES money as we get the clarity of where that should be applied. So you're correct, that that negative balance would be offset by some portion of the CARES money. Okay. And we talked about a little bit, I think, at a couple meetings ago, but basically the, the metrics in which we're um, estimating our sales tax loss. Um, and I've seen some reports out of uh, different organizations uh, basically assessing that our, our Central Valley area and our city is going is, is really being hit a little bit differently than other places because we're full of essential workers in this community and we've been working um, still. So I can understand how the uh, numbers of, estima of estimating our sales tax, someone could say that that's very cons you know, conservative, but I understand that it's really based on our market in our area. Um, it's it, it makes sense, so I just wanted to, to kind of attest to that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Nadine? No questions? No. Council Member Ariano, a question for Nadine? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I So, in going back to what the mayor had, because I kind of caught the end of it, the frozen positions, i.e. like the police chief and the fire chief, if we wanted to go ahead and allocate the, for those positions, we would have to dip into the reserves as of this time. Is that correct? Uh, well, right now, based on this draft budget, there's a million dollars of cushion. So I would caution against using that based on the concern over the CARES money. Um, but either allocating all of the CARES money, and that's where that million dollar cushion is, or reserves, those would be the two options. Um, as it stands right now, if we had the full allocation and we're able to utilize all two and a half million, you could allocate those two positions within that, but there's some concern associated with that, so that's why we're not recommending going that route at this point in time. Okay, but it doesn't limit our options. We still have options. Correct, yeah. We just yeah, have and to that's, put our money yeah. where our mouth is and execute those options. Yeah, and I would say the, the key aspect this year that is, you know, very different than I think most budgets that anybody is used to doing in, in municipal government, I would, I would consider this, you know, more of a preliminary budget in the grand scheme of things because of the uncertainty unknowns that we typically don't have. We don't normally have this kind of gray cloud hanging over our head. So um, the, the idea here and the commitment is the same that it was in May was we would be giving you update mon monthly updates of where the revenues are for fiscal year 1920, right, to know where we end the year in and those final updated expenditures. Um, and then as I committed to last time, this is likely, and it's a promise, there's going to be a, a budget amendment that comes with the end of the first quarter um, to true all of this up because there's likely some changes. And so the, the idea of um, holding vacant positions unfunded provides to not make decisions until we have all of that information. So basically moving this down the road a little bit so we know all of the information before we make 
those type of decisions that the last thing you want to do is hire somebody and then have to make an unfortunate decision the other direction. So this allows us some time to do that with some cushion to ensure that we're not putting ourselves in a, in a position of using reserves. Again, not counting on using any savings from 1920. Uh, that's something we talked about last time, but based on you know what we heard from council and some concerns about you know what those sales tax numbers come in, we adjusted that forecast down um, in a more conservative manner to ensure that we protect that reserve balance at all at all costs. Um, based on the council's direction. I, I appreciate that. And I think this is a good um, starting working document. And, it, you know, the years that are ahead of us are going to look a lot different than the years that are behind us because of what we've gone through in the last six months. And so making sure that we can operate in a 30-day uh, contingency mode is important. And I wanted to thank the... Uh, accounting staff, I know this is a lot of work and it's a lot of work to get this uh, out. And it's very, the slides that were presented are very uh, reader friendly. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, yeah, a couple of comments now. Um, and I'm referring to the possible CARES money. Uh, yeah, I, I see your point there because I, I don't see where we would want to allocate that for anything other than part-time or one-time use because it's not money we can depend on in future years. Yeah, this is this is so one-time expenditures, right? And it's right. only eligible to be expended between the, the date that it was passed, you know, the middle of the end of March and December 31st. There, there is some conversation out there about that outside deadline being extended with this idea that there may be a second wave. So, you know, and they haven't allocated all the CARES money. So there is a possibility that that outside date may get pushed out. But as, as of today, the deadline on the guidelines that we know today is December 31st. And items that we've had to use where we've had incidents where maybe the police had to use uh, uh, overtime that they weren't planning, things like that, that's all being attributed to COVID money, anyway, so that would be part of that care. As long as we can, as long as directly related, or directly or indirectly related, yes. Um, so we were counting for those direct costs. And you can see the line item um, under COVID direct expenses, and those are eligible for FEMA as well. And this is one of those few funding sources where you can actually match FEMA refunds as well. So we have the ability to do that, which is not normal. They normally don't match, but in this case we can. So if, if we don't think we're getting a $2.5 million, I mean, it, we're, we're hoping, we're praying, and great guess, then why do we have it completely in the the 2021 budget but you're saying that some of those expenses will come out of 1920 so it seems like we're counting it twice no just counting it once but just for ease and simplicity of d demonstrating it and not knowing enough on how to allocate it um you know we could have taken a guess and said yeah there's 1.25 million allocated for fiscal year 1920 and 1.25 for night for 2021 we didn't feel confident at this point in the ballgame of making that determination until we've done more analysis. So we thought it was cleaner to just show it in 2021. Uh, simpler for the math aspect, but knowing there's expenditures in 1920 that this would be gone across. So uh, we can do it however the council would like. Um, we made this decision for simplicity. We thought it was easier to show those revenues in 2021, um, but we can do it either way. So I, I have a couple questions about the PERS that we usually prepay PERS. How, how much is that and where does that come from? Well, we pay our unfunded liability once a year and Tina can chime in if I'm misspeaking. Um, and that is based on what PERS tells us the estimate is for the upcoming year. We've already budgeted that amount in the 2021 with PERS. So we charge to the departments with payroll based on what we think that amount's going to be, and we've already budgeted for that. And how much is it? In for 2021, it's a little over $5 million for the unfunded. Is that correct, Tina? Okay. And so it's included in the individual line items for each department? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Councilmember Ariano, anything else? I'm uh, good, thank you. So uh, some other questions. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, um, department head uh, Allison Van Gelder was, was uh, 
able to put monies into um, getting vehicles again. We zeroed it out last year and we're zeroed out again for both police and fire. So uh, how's, how do we anticipate that the vehicles that they're using aren't going to need to be replaced? How, how are we just trying to bank on Uber? <laughs> yeah, getting? clearly the, you know, the strategy that was employed last year and is employed again this year is not sustainable in the long run. Um, and this is something that, that has to give, but in light of all of these circumstances, um, again, we do not anticipate this going forward because we can't sustain it. But uh, in terms of trying to find a balance, um, I don't know the specifics of what was all allocated there. I don't know if you know those, those numbers, but I don't believe it's a big number. Um, I think it's very small of what is transferred into the equipment replacement for this year. And there are some balances in those funds that if they need vehicles that they could possibly purchase. Again, I don't know where they're um, budgeting. You know, if they're budgeting to purchase vehicles, I think it's just mainly what they need. And if they can obtain grants, I know they're working on things like that to obtain grants for some of the vehicles. Um, that's upcoming in the next uh, probably month or two. Because it looks like it's... 200 out of fire and 419 plus out of police. I mean, that I, I think we're starting to set ourselves up a little bit for failure here as we look forward to what's going to happen. Realistically, we, I mean, we've had some uh, trauma, if you will, with one of our engines previously. Uh, one, God forbid, uh, collision with any one of them, we have nothing to, to back ourselves up here. And, and I think we, we actually have fun, a fund set aside for the replacement, so, and so that, is, that has been budgeted. No, we have fund. There's already a fund there's, in 506 for engine replacement. Yes, there is. And okay. that is planned for replacement. It actually is budgeted, if I'm right, correct, in the current fiscal year 1920. The timing wise, we are holding off to make that purchase. So, that's yeah, that's correct. Our 506 fund does have sufficient funds to purchase one engine now. However, I'm trying to find a more cost-efficient model for a different side of town. So um, that is the plan to repurpose one of them. And uh, another one we have just put in for a, a firefighter grant to try to fund the second engine, as, as the mayor knows, um, when you went back east to hope, hopefully – pay for the other one because that would be a very big ticket item if we could get that so that was just recently submitted and it's going through the process yeah that AFG grant if we were to receive that would obviously make a significant impact on our, our fleet and then be able to leverage our existing fund balance with a grant and then we'd have the, the fleet uh, up to date okay just uh, I'm just going off of what you're submitting to us like page 124 for fire page 100 for police and it's transferring um, out money the vehicle purchase for future so that looks to me if I'm just reading it you know as layman term that we're we're not supporting making sure that we have the equipment so I, I'm just trying to read this stuff as we go along each year they they put money aside mm -hmm. and then that grows in fund I believe it's 506 Correct. for the equipment yeah. replacement the, those transfers um, are going to that fund balance for future replacement Yes. But I'm sorry, did you say we zeroed it out last year and didn't use it? We may have not transferred, didn't fund but. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. Chief can speak to both of them. Oh, I, I last I year, Mayor is correct. Last year yeah. for both police and fire, we did not transfer money in there to save it both into, well, at least in the fires 240 and 506. I'm sure police probably the same. Um, no, okay, I'll let, Nino, I'll let Nino talk then after me. But for fire, yeah, we zeroed out our 240 and 506. We still have fund balances in there from right. previous years. We've just had to reallocate and look for different ways to, since we're not funding them last year and this year. So I'll let Chief speak to the other. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, you're correct. Um, last year's um, funding for police vehicles, uh, we were budgeted to do 419, 419,000. Uh, we actually should be doing about 550,000. Uh, we did not budget that amount of money. In other words, we didn't take money from the general fund police budget and send it into that account. That's how we saved $500,000. Uh, we're doing that again this year, but under 240, that is uh, police equipment. That's our handguns, shotguns, etc. And that amount of money is set aside every year. So when the end of life comes for the, that equipment, we will be able to purchase it. So the 87,000 you see there, Yes, that is uh, being moved over into that account for later purchases. But as for vehicles, no. 
we're, we're not moving any monies over for vehicles. And Nadine is correct. There is money in that account. But the whole idea of that account is a savings account where we put a certain amount of money away every year. So when our vehicles hit five years, six years, we can replace them. Um, hopefully that answers the question. All right. Um, if not, let's go ahead and open it to the public. Anybody wishing to speak in regard to this budget, please feel free to call. Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to remind our participants, um, you have the option to use the raise your hand feature, or you may also dial star nine from your telephone keypad. Since we have not had public participation yet, I'll briefly just remind members of the public that they will be allotted three minutes for comments, and comments will be taken in the order of which they appear. When it is a member's turn to speak, they will hear an automated prompt indicating that their line has been unmuted, and that is when the three minutes will begin. Mayor, I have a caller with the last name Sims. Caller Sims. Hi there. I wish to ask a few questions um, and then make a few comments regarding uh, the budget proposal. Um, the first couple of questions that I wanted to ask about um, are looking at the presentation. Um, it looks like uh, when it, it lists the funding for police over the last three years, including 18, 19, 19, 20, 20 and 21, when I went back and did the math, it looked like it actually in 1819 was 19 million and change rather than 21 million and change for police. And so I'm wondering why there's almost a $2 million discrepancy in what I can find in the original funding from that year, as opposed to the information here in the presentation. I also wanted to know why it is even a possibility that we would even consider using one-time reserve money for any kind of additional public safety when that is clearly money that should be saved for emergencies and any kind of spending that isn't meant for long-term positions. Um, aside from those questions, I would also like to add a few comments. I want to encourage the council to consider public services as important as public safety. We have a considerable homeless population. We have roads in disrepair like Fosberg. The police funding has continued to increase over the last seven plus years, whereas others have taken huge hits, parks and recreation, public uh, facilities. And I just want to encourage the council to consider investing in their communities in terms of public services uh, for example, the prevention and youth line item that from 1819 to 1920 took a substantial hit from about $700,000 to $620,000 to reinvest in those programs and really consider your community, their services as important as their safety. I also wanted to add that when we're looking at amounts like $87,000 being put away from our money to save specifically for weapons, for police weapons, like handguns and shotguns, when we're looking at programs and events budgets for our parks and recreation of being maybe half that, I think it's time to maybe reevaluate where we're using our money. I know it's tight and I know it's difficult, but we need to consider our community an investment. Thank you so much. You want to go ahead and answer those questions? Well, I'm trying to find the 19 million, but there's multiple departments in police. There's the operations, there's the patrol, and um, there's the animal services. Those are all under police. And that 21 million for 1819 is the cumulative number of all those departments. And that is an actual number that comes from our financial statements and our you know, actual print documents. So those are completed numbers, not fully audited. They're almost complete. So if you can point out the 19 million, I'd be glad to look at that. Okay. Next caller. The next caller, I have Lynch Consulting. Caller Lynch Consulting. Oh, hi, uh, this is Mike Lynch. I live in Rose Circle. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, the um, I called or I got on the line here. I was going to comment in public comment, and then you did the budget presentation. But my comment is about the budget. Um, recently, my the neighborhood app I have in Rose Circle showed that there was a survey that the city was doing on having a uh, sales tax increase. And so I called up tonight to say I wasn't surveyed. I wasn't one of the people who got the poll, but but I uh, am strongly against doing that at this time because of the unemployment, because of the uh, the fact that all of our businesses are under enormously costly restrictions, as they should be, by the way, don't get me wrong, uh, to fight the virus. And I think it's just the wrong time to do a sales tax increase. I think it sends an absolutely a horrible message, especially since the state ballot will have four or five costly initiatives uh, on the ballot that we will be voting on anyway. But after your presentation tonight, and I want to compliment the city manager and the staff, it looks like you don't need to do that. So I assume that's not going to happen, at least for this year. Uh, and so I wanted to say, you know, I, I think the sales tax issue should be put to bed at least until we're somewhat down the line on recovery from COVID. So that is my my comment, and I want to. I wish all of you good luck. I know it's a very difficult work you're doing, and the um, um, and you're you're struggling a whole enormous challenges, and we're with you, and we hope you make the right decisions. Thank you. Next caller. The next caller, I have the name Debbie. Caller Debbie. Hi. I I have a question regarding freezing the fire chief and the police chief position and if both could address what that those departments are going to look like and how do you feel it will impact the um, safety of our community going forward So we've been operating without uh, a fire chief in a fire chief position for a year now. Um, two years prior, our fire chief was serving as the interim city manager. So at that, for another year, we were acting without a fire chief. So we're, it's not a good option. I mean, during these extraordinary times, we're able to manage. Uh, we, it is not obviously going to be a long-term solution for us. Uh, we, with the, uh, when this budget goes through, we will have uh, a total of eight positions frozen from last year and this year. So we are operating on a very thin margin, so to speak. When we, you know, we don't have anything left. It's going to affect operations. It affects admin. Um, the longer you go without a department head, too, it just. Uh, trickles down throughout the department for morale, for you know, strategic planning and pushing the department forward. So um, in the short term, it's something we have been doing, we can continue to do. It's more important, in my opinion, to keep as many boots on the ground as we can to, uh, for those uh, 911 calls. But in the long term, yeah, I would love it if we could get a fire chief. So for the police department, we've already reduced from three divisions down to two divisions. So I have myself and I have two captains. Um, and those two captains are very capable of doing a chief's job. As a matter of fact, um, they could easily get hired anywhere else. There's uh, over 30 chief's jobs available already. Having said that, this budget that is before you utilizes uh, cost savings from not hiring a police chief and utilizing both captains intermittently, as I've discussed with the city manager, that'll save the city significant funds for our fiscal year that you're looking at the budget for. It is not something that you need to do or plan for long range planning. Um, and I have an opportunity to speak towards it. We had one previous caller say, now is not the time for a sales tax. Understand you're paying sales tax when you go to Livermore or you go to Modesto or you go to these other cities that are already have sales tax that fund public safety, public works, parks, recreation, etc. So we need to be much more focused on long range. This is short range. Having no police chief 
and utilizing the captains to do those administrative duties will work for the short term and save money. Not buying vehicles short term and save money, not long term. Long term, this city needs to find another source of revenue. We're over 25 years behind on that. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Next caller. Next caller, the last name Camara. Caller Camara. Caller Camara. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I'll, I'll get to it since I know I only have three minutes or so. Um, in light of uh, recent events, both nationally and in Turlock, comments have been uh, made at the last city council meeting and, of course, online via social media. I'll dare to speak on behalf of many of the residents of Turlock. I feel that the council needs to reassure the citizens of Turlock of its commitment to public safety. Um, I would ask that the council at its next regular meeting take up and consider uh, vote, voting on a resolution of support for the Turlock Police Department along the lines of, uh, I, I pinned something here, I'll just read that to you quickly. The uh, proposed resolution would read something as, uh, whereas in recognition of the increase in crime rates in the city of Turlock and in recognition of the recent vandalism of Turlock City Hall and multiple local businesses, and whereas in recognition of the increasing concerns of citizens of Turlock for their safety and for and that uh, of their property, and in recognition of the calls for review of police procedures and defunding the police, whereas in recognition of Police Chief Amifar's recent report addressing such a review and delineating the multiple years of positive organizational conduct and exceptional performance by members of the Turlock Police Department Whereas in recognition of the underfunding and understaffing of the Turlock Police Department and in recognition of the need to assure the citizens of Turlock that their safety is of paramount importance to this council and all staff and that the security of their homes, businesses and schools shall not be compromised or neglected by way of budget cuts or staff reductions during this tumultuous time. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the city council of the city of Turlock declare its full faith and confidence in our local police department and its management and directs the city manager to fully and properly fund the Turlock Police Department and encourages the city manager and police chief to continue their review of policies and use of increased training to ensure all citizens are treated with respect, dignity, and fairness. I hope, uh, I hope the council would consider this resolution at a future meeting. That's all. Next caller. The next caller, I have the last name Hunt. Caller Hunt. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Denise Hunt. I, I live here in Turlock. And I'm commenting to the council tonight uh, because I've become convinced it's time to increase community involvement in how law enforcement services are delivered to Turlock. Um, TPD provides a variety of services to our city, not just patrol. And when I began exploring how police services are organized and provided in Turlock, I was pleased to see actually that a lot of effort has been put forth to focus on relationships with the community and on transparency. It was easy to find an annual report with a number of incidents, arrests, and use of force details. Use of force incidents have declined steadily in just the last three years from 33 incidents in 2017 to 17 incidents in 2019. That's by half. Uh, I was extremely pleased to see uh, the chief discontinued the use of the carotid control hold on June 5th of this year. And I think Turlock was the first city in the county to do so. Modesto PD just announced they're doing the same. I know you're considering the budget tonight and I, I glanced through the budget. I, I see that the police department's uh, 21 million is about half of the uh, general fund. Uh, so it's, it's a significant um, bunch of public services that, that are funded there. I was actually surprised that there doesn't exist a citizens advisory committee of any kind for the police. Um, and I'm commenting tonight, but I think it's time to set one up. 
The only concerning statistic I noted is that the number of use of forces incidents are pretty evenly distributed between Hispanic Latino males and white males, but the population in Turlock is 72% white and 29% Hispanic and Latino. Uh, and I wonder at that discrepancy. I know the chief is moving on. I commend his efforts at connecting with the community and especially his actions in the past several weeks when things were tense and could have turned ugly. Um, I think one way of ensuring the transparency of the police department is through a citizen's review body. We've all lived through the tragic event of George Floyd's murder and the unrest this has brought to our society. This is the time to ask questions, seek answers, and set up systems that make our law enforcement services more transparent to our communities, especially in the time of leadership transition. I urge the board to establish a citizens review committee for the Turlock Police Department. Now is the time. I'm white. I grew up in a town pretty much like Turlock. <clears throat> I've never feared the police. I know there are people who live here who do fear the police. And I'm here to say that no one living in our city should fear law enforcement. We need to change that. It's time. It's past time. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Next caller with the last name Ensley. Caller Ensley. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, everybody for the really hard work you've done on this budget. I know it's not a, not easy to make these financial decisions. I, I, I've got to say I sort of agree with Mr. Lynch that, you know, times are tough financially in a world of COVID. Uh, and sometimes expenses are tough. But I also totally agree with the chief that we're filling gaps with like insulation or something. And what we need to do right now is to be able to look forward. I, I really do support a sales tax. I know that when I go out of town, I really do spend money that other communities are getting the benefit of. Um, you've, got a, you've got a section in your budget for tourism. Uh, people are coming to our town. For us not to take advantage of uh, perhaps, you know, gaining some financial reward from that. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense. I totally support the sales tax and um, it'll give us the money that we need to go forward and not just always be trying to um, make do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller. The next caller with the last name Strom. Dr. Strom. Hi, um, thank you all so much for the hard work you've put in um, on that budget. Uh, I, huh, I can't even imagine what it must be like to be you guys uh, trying to deal with this right now. So thank you to everybody for all your efforts um, on that. I want to associate myself with caller Denise Hunt's points. Uh, I think they were well stated and, and I uh, absolutely agree with uh, what she said. I want to take some time to talk about some other things. Um, I don't know how many of you folks showed up for the first annual Juneteenth celebration this last weekend, but I have to tell you it was amazing. It was beautiful. It was uplifting. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for that lovely celebration of the last enslaved people being formed of their freedom. And I'd like to thank the uh, police department, uh, Chief Emifer, for all of the work that he has done uh, thus far to uh, allow a very peaceful, wonderful celebrations. Uh, I remain disappointed at Mayor Bublack's refusal to disavow Ted House's racist speech. It's almost as though it seems like maybe you agree with the things he wrote and continues to write. Uh, recently on his Twitter feed, he posted a homophobic remark about transgender high school and college athletes. And he also referred to protesters who take a knee as terrorists. So am I to assume that you agree with those positions since you continue to support this candidate? Uh, you and six other mayors, uh, Mayor Boo Black, um, you wrote in an April 20th, 2020 letter to Governor Newsom that the COVID-19 shutdown, quote, does not work for our county, end quote, and that, quote, we as mayors are each proud of how our citizens and businesses stepped up to help flatten the curve of the COVID-19 pandemic in our region, end quote. He then demanded seven Stanislaus County cities, including Turlock, be allowed to reopen. Clearly, that was not based on science. 
And I'm curious about how that hubris has worked out for you, given that we are not just a hot spot, but Stanislaus County was literally the first two words of concern out of the California Secretary of Health's mouth at yesterday's COVID-19 governor's press conference. So I'd love it if you could address uh, your position, uh, your continued position on um, the, the uh, reopening of Turlock, given where we are at as a hotspot. Thank you. We'll have a COVID update at the end. Next caller. Mayor, at this time, we do not have any other members of the public that would like to address the council regarding the budget item. All right, I will close the public hearing, bring oh, it back may. to the... <laughs> oh, <laughs> actually it went up and then it went down. I do have one other mayor. Proceed, please. Um, thank you. The last name, Shaver. And I have one more that's coming up. Terry? Shaver, are you there? Terry, can you hear us? Ms. Shaver, you're on the line. Terry, are you there? All right. We'll go ahead and try another call. Is there another? Mayor, at this time, I do not have any other member of public that would like to address the council. I've heard that. <laughs> okay, I'm closing the public hearing. Bring it back to council for some uh, more conversation. One thing, <clears throat> Mayor, if I may, sure. um, want to clarify one thing on the that we didn't touch on early on the the fire department staffing. So, as the council is aware, uh, with last year's budget, fiscal year nineteen twenty, um, the staffing plan that was presented um, by the fire department for the uh, available staffing that are on duty and how that um, filters down based on who's available, the number of the use of the SUV, and then ultimately browning out. Um, <clears throat> once that was approved, uh, that system was able through the vacancies, the vacant positions that were budgeted to be able to not have to implement that fully um, where we didn't have to brown out stations over the course of fiscal year 1920. As we were running towards the end of those um, resources of the vacant positions, COVID hit. This council approved the idea of um, the fire department restaffing that engine to ensure coverage during COVID. So the budget as presented uh, this evening is status quo in that respect. It's showing the same um, staffing plan going forward. With the COVID still in place and those CARES money, we would recommend continuing to operate the fire department as was approved under that emergency order and continue to keep that engine staff utilizing those CARES those CARES monies. So wanted to clarify that if we don't utilize those CARES or FEMA monies, then we will revert to that staffing plan that which with the vacant positions that are currently proposed would result in uh, brown out of, of a station much more frequently uh, as a result. So wanted to clarify worst case, but still operating under the same authority that the council has given under the, the emergency that's still in place to continue operating that way. But just wanted to make sure that was clear and we're happy to discuss that further. Question about that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, as has been uh, spoken to by our staff, what we're looking at here is not a sustainable budget. It's also one that we don't have an incredible amount of confidence in being able to project for an entire year. Um, I, in talking with community members this past week um, and also with the city manager, I think it is a, very appropriate for us to be looking at what we will be adopting here as uh, a preliminary budget with uh, anticipation of reviewing and making necessary updates once quarter one data is accumulated and uh, provided for us. There's, there's a lot of things up in the air that are going to be critical to whether or not um, we're going to be able to make the changes to 
make this city a little bit more whole or whether or not we need to continue with what is, um, you know, a, a thing that I think most citizens um, are disappointed in. You know, this is not the level of service that they want to see from their police, from their fire, from planning, from, what was it, tw we're about 20%, what was the percent vacancy? Yeah. Um, yeah. For, with the current budget, it's yeah. 20. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's, I think it's 16. That, that's something that we're uh, in, in a time of crisis with incredible uncertainty, really having uh, to unfortunately look at as an option, but really uh, want us to look to that uh, quarter one closure as an opportunity to revisit some of these numbers and um, and then hopefully lock down something more sustainable in that for the for the full year. Um, yeah, I think that this, uh, it, it should not be considered sustainable to anybody. This is not a situation where we want to continue these budgeting practices. I mean, we're putting money away. We're saving money from positions that we need. And that's, that's one of the basis that, uh, uh, that is really helping us being able to put some money back into our savings account right now. Um, we are saving money uh, by not fully funding departments that need to be funded for our, based on our population size. We're saving money by not replacing vehicles. I mean, these, this is not a time to consider these cuts um, excess. Uh, these are these are things that every the uh, successful city city needs to be accounting for every year, um, and it's it's clear to be acknowledged that I don't think any of us up here would would call, think this budget could live past the end of the next year. Probably sooner than that. We'll have to look at an amendment once we figure out. Um, that's what I'm expecting once we figure out the cost estimations of the CARES Act and the refund and what, how we will really are looking in our sales tax projections. Um, so it's it's the best we can do. Uh, I th I think that it's very key, though, for everyone to understand that we are we are saving money right now based on positions that our city needs to be feel, filled for the service level that we have felt in the past before our po our population has grown so much, and that we can still continue to deserve for our citizens. Councilmember. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, I know this is, again, we're, we all, everybody up here knows that what we're looking at is not sustainable. We knew that last year when we said we wanted zero deficit budget. We knew it was not going to be sustainable. Uh, nobody was anticipate, anticipating COVID-19. Uh, so uh, if it wouldn't have been for COVID, most of the people that I've spoken to feel that we would have been coming out of this uh, a little bit better, still not perfect, but a little bit better than than where we are right now. And uh, again, we asked uh, our uh, staff to put a budget together and we pretty much tied their hands. We said, you can't spend any more money. So give us the best you have with what you may or may not have. And so that's like, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's hard to work under those conditions. Uh, you guys are trying. Uh, I commend that. Um, will this get us through the entire year? I don't know that either. Uh, I have my doubts as well. But it's a place to start. Um, we need to keep going. We need to keep focused on, on the goal. Uh, we can't be kicking anything else down the road. Uh, I think most of us feel that that's kind of what got us to where we are in the first place. So we need to uh, do the best we can with what we have at the, at, at the moment, and hopefully things will get better and uh, we will be able to change some of these negatives into positives. Um, again, I want to commend you for doing the work you've done. Uh, you presented us a difficult uh, it was difficult to put the product together, but you know we, we kind of tied your hands. We said, "This is all you get. There's no more." So, uh, thank you, Council Member Ariano. I just um, <clears throat> just a couple comments. The 
fact that we're putting a half cent sales tax or a whole cent, I don't know if we've decided that fully, but that's not going to get us out of the woods either. We still have to make some accommodations with our departments, which the departments have stepped up to the challenge and they're doing. We just need to make sure that the reserves are for dipping into when you have something catastrophic happen. Well, we have that now and we still haven't gone into our reserves, which I'm okay with if we can, you know, get some extra money from the federal government. But this is not, I'm, I'm actually at a place right now where there's 30,000 people and there's 15 police officers on duty at any given time. So it's very safe. I feel very safe and I feel safe in Turlock too, but we do need to be able to step up our police and fire public safety um, position to meet the requirements and the demands of our community. So we have to figure out a way that we can add those positions back in and still have a sustainable business model for the city. So this is a working document. It's not set in stone. We're going to have to manipulate things maybe every 30 days and just keep an eye on it. And that's why we have a city manager that's going to bring that forward. So uh, thanks for all the hard work and effort and to be continued. Okay. Um, I just have a couple more questions. Uh, you put an org chart in there, Mr. Wells. Um, what, what do you see that, that yielding you as far as savings? The org chart is what the budget is drafted on other than those frozen positions. So those savings are accommodated in there, but that org chart is what how it exists today. And then in reference to our engineering, what is it, $2.9 million <coughs> we still owe, we kind of talked uh, about it several times, and, and, and so I don't see it here. So I, I, I so thought the, we were going to make a public discussion about it, but where did that go? So in the staff report, it's indicated that that plan for addressing that long-term uh, fund balance, negative fund balance, would be presented to this council no later than December 31st of 2020. With the so, assumption at this moment that that money is already being used for, to cover the cost? I'm not following where, the question. Where is that 2.9 million going right now? So 2.9 million is a negative fund balance. Correct. So that enterprise fund for the engineering is a negative dollar amount. So it's a, it's a liability that is out there. And it, we, we as a council decide, gave direction that we would come up with a repayment strategy by the end of this year for and, that. And in the staff report, I, I believe it speaks to that. that the 2.9 will have a report or a, 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 plan, a plan of attack Correct. by the end of this year to address that 2.9 million as of now. We're just paying the... Um, as of now, we're balancing, balancing so that that, that fund balance is not increasing, not right? So there's no general fund. It's a very minor amount is what's currently shown in the budget. We're managing that so that that fund balance does not grow. And if there is any association with that fund, the general fund is covering that so that the number doesn't get bigger. So there is some general fund being used towards it. So Currently budgeted right now, 19,000, as indicated in the staff report, I don't remember, 19,383, I think, yeah. was it, or something like yeah. that. That's what's currently okay. shown. So uh, on page one of the summary of fund balances adopted budget, which is what I went through the whole weekend, just what you gave us, um, if you look at the first line, projected fund balance ending in 63020 for un unreserved, You'll see a number, and I hope you can put it up there if possible. Uh, it's four million three hundred thirteen, and I wrote on it something two eighty nine, maybe or something. Um, that is below our our uh, our resolution. And then when you end, you're saying here projected fund balance on um, for the next fiscal year, we're going to be under ours as as well. So I have some concerns that 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 was submitted to us and now uh less than an hour before this meeting we're finding these these new numbers so can you kind of show us how we got from we were below and we hadn't signed off on a resolution to now we're pumped up with an additional because even in these numbers my understanding is the 2.5 million covid was was injected into it so how, how did we get there if you look at the um PowerPoint here, the 10 million in the estimated actuals for 1920, the general fund is comprised of fund 110, 111, 113, 116, and 120. 
So if you look at your summary, it totals $10,704,775. Um, the auditor's round, and so you see the 774 there. It's a dollar off from this worksheet, but that is where the general fund reserve comes from, and it is made up of the amounts in all those funds, which are all general fund. But, Does that make sense? But according to page three of the agenda staff, it says the general fund reserve requires seven percent of the budget expenses, mm -hmm. or six point five million, whichever is greater, mm -hmm. in unassigned reserves. So uh, unassigned. So the unass we're moving these numbers around because that that leads me to believe we can't add one thir one thirteen, one eleven, one sixteen, and those. You have to keep it just the the unassigned, correct? The unassigned is the total of that 10 million less anything that's assigned, which if we look here, the assigned would be the non-spendable, which is the 25,000, and that's in these numbers, but, but that wasn't on like previously, I think May 13th, I don't know if I have that one with me. The numbers were different on that, so I, I'm just trying, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to grasp my head because I know things are always fluid. Yes. So um, these numbers lead, lead me to believe when I asked uh, the other day, mm -hmm. what's our snapshot? That our snapshot was kind of bad. So uh, it, we didn't hear it. But I mean, if we go by just what the words say here mm -hmm. and only unassigned, then we're, we're not achieving that according to my understanding. I mean, these are these are all assigned here. Parks and Rec, uh, the sp public safety. Am I on to something? The public safety and the tourism are committed, mm -hmm. and I believe that's something that council can make decisions on. The assigned is the compensated absences. In previous presentations, we showed that at 100%. Um, that has been something that we have looked at other agencies in the area, and we have not found any that show compensated absences at all in their uh, general fund reserve. We felt it prudent. Um, to put 20% in so that there would be some reserve there. Um, I believe our finance director looked at several agencies and none of them showed that. Um, so that may be where you're seeing different numbers um, because we do have that. But I believe at the May 26 presentation, we did show compensated absences at the 20%. I believe you did. Yes. But then in, in other numbers we haven't. And that's just, I mean, for, for us to be laymen, budget people and trying to work off of what we get, it, it's really difficult because even the titles have changed on occasion, whether we call them um, committed or un, un, um, unreserved or whatever. So we're, we're putting it in a position where I feel like we really are getting a little hinky here. And I mean, at the end of the day, obviously Mr. Wells knows that his, his job is fiscal responsibility. I'm scared that we're going to plan on money we don't have and we're going to get caught up because we're spinning some in the back end and we're going to spin some in the front and we're not going to get it all and we're going to we're going to find ourselves in a in a bad way understanding that we only got so much time I, I appreciate that but i think 60 days we come back and start looking at this and how we're going to start saving because we're spending down on ongoing costs which is like the first rule of fiscal responsibility you don't do so I'm just making my statement that I'm, I'm a little concerned about where we go from here. If we, we can't wait a whole quarter, I think we really need to start looking at how we're going to do some cost savings to make sure we're doing the right thing for the taxpayer. The, the project, the, the budget that you guys have proposed for, for us here does not have us spending any reserve. Is that correct? The, the draft for 1920 shows $36,000 of, of expenditure of okay reserve. and then and then 2021 what we're looking at is positive is a positive so correct. we're not spending into the reserve correct so regard regardless of the figures here we're not putting forward a plan that spends into the reserves correct and that's not what i'm my implication is is my implication is that we're these numbers keep changing because i mean if you look at that one page you're like okay gosh we, we've got to slow that down so we need to have a, a constant uh, understanding of what that looks like and it's got to be continuous and it's got to come to us in advance before the meeting no changes and in 60 days we need to be looking at it again seeing what we're doing with our expenditures that's the only way we're all going to be on the same page and know what these numbers mean and how we're doing the right thing so uh with that i appreciate what you guys have done uh, this is it's very difficult but we're we're getting forward we're moving forward 
Sure. And just and just something just again you could school me, Toby. But on um, when I was looking at the chart, I did notice the use of money and property. The 0.7 percent. Um, is that is that normal? Is it, it doesn't seem like we're getting very much. That, that's usually like investment money or something. Use of money on the uh, general fund reserve by source. The your chart, pie chart. Oh, okay. I, didn't know, I didn't know what you were looking at. Sorry, my page apologies. Four. Okay, page four. It just seems like a use of money at 0.7 percent. It doesn't seem like we're getting much for our investments. Is that? Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to go take it to Vegas and double down, but, <laughs> well, but I'm thinking, uh, you know, is, is there any uh, for way a, that I mean, we if, can, we can a, look at any of that? And a forty-two million dollar budget, obviously, as I indicated before, generally um, municipalities are very conservative on their investments and wanting to keep funds liquid versus locked away. So, I mean, that that doesn't surprise me. Um, the more risk you take on your investment strategy, you know, obviously the more return you can get. I would say with where we're at today, I wouldn't recommend uh, taking much more risk, um, but that's obviously something we can look at um, through the course of the year, see if there's other ways to um, be more um, aggressive we when it- We get 1%. <laughs> right. feel yeah, typically, I mean, most of those investments were, are in LAFE and other locations that are pretty, pretty low and interest rates this year are obviously really low. Weird, I mean, it's a great time to borrow money if you have to, but uh, getting returns on investment is really low. So yeah. that so number doesn't surprise so me in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. So if I could just one more on page 32. I'm just, I, I got confused by uh, the city attorney is a, a is not a personnel per se. He's actually um, contracted. And so I got confused where we started paying PERS and, and liability and stuff. Could you just explain that real quick? Get to the right page. Page. Um, 32. 32. 32. Um, we have a part-time staff member that does investigations, and he is an employee that's subject to PERS, and that's where that comes in. That's not for the attorney. It's for the part-time investigations gotcha. person that we hired. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. I'm just curious. All of a sudden, I thought he was getting a really good deal. <laughs> uh, and again, no, city, no, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Doug was going to chime in. Yeah, and again, that's the city attorney. So just for the department. record, He's under there uh, because of the nature of the work that he performs, but it has nothing to do with us. He doesn't work for our firm or have anything to do with that. Gotcha. Okay, what's the will of the council? Yeah, move to adopt. Move to adopt the resolution. In a second. Yeah, we are definitely going to provide monthly reports. If uh, there was two different conversations, obviously our commitment was we would like to have the full first quarter information. That way we have all of the financials received for sales tax for 1920, which we think is really critical. Um, uh, but again, that's the will of council. How soon you, do you know the COVID, that how much you actually truly get? Well, we know we'll get, if we can allocate it, we know we can get 2.5 million. And if the state comes through, it actually is probably closer to 3 million. But our ability to allocate it comes down to how those rules are. Right. We're probably, that's what I'm saying. But so. we're, I would, based on our expectation, it's at least 60 days before we'd have full clarity on that. So I, looking at the, the monthly continued reporting, at the ability to make amendments if necessary, but uh, with, the, with the closure of quarter one being a timeline that I would like for us to, to make, make it, yeah, To make an amendment. To make the amended, yeah. 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 Okay, we have a motion and a second. Clerk, call the roll, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, just, Go ahead. Just to restate. Can you say, that? say it in a more roundabout way. I believe that is to, to adopt the resolution that adopts this budget with the understanding that we will have a uh, re uh, report back uh, reflecting the quarter one numbers as soon as you get them. Well, monthly reporting. Monthly so reporting. With a with quarterly an update. With the closure of quarter one. Correct. And collect. Yeah, and That's what you lost I yeah. take the I take the friendly. <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? Yeah. Yeah. Clerk, do you have it? <laughs> I was going to say, let's make sure Jen has it. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. So we would be adopting a budget for the City of Turlock general and non-general fund budgets for fiscal year 2020-21 with monthly reporting as well as a quarterly update. Is that correct? Yeah. We'll talk classification of preliminary budget if possible. All right. Are we adding preliminary? 
more words. Okay, very good. So I have a motion by Councilmember Larson and a second by Councilmember Nisrati. Councilmember Ariano. Yes. Councilmember Larson. Yes. Councilmember Nisrati. Yes. Councilmember Escare. Yes. Mayor Bublack. Yes, it passes 5 0. We're going to take a five minute break for uh, whatever. <laughs> All right, you ready, George? Let's do this. All right, I will call this meeting back to order. We have a proclamation briefing, a uh, series Merced Extension project, uh, Mr. Wells.
<laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Council, uh, this evening uh, is a briefing on the Ultimat Community Express, otherwise known as ACE, in the series to Merced Extension Project. So a little bit of background here on ACE. Um, this ACE received funding in 2017 under SB1 and SB132 to improve and extend their existing route that goes from, uh, in essence, Stockton to San Jose and extending that service down to Merced. Um, that funding provided for the capital, and in 2018, an environmental impact report was um, prepared for the entire stretch at a program level, i.e. the highest level, and then a project level EIR was included in that original EIR to, co EIR to cover the stretch from Lathrop to Ceres. Um, that stretch, so phase one, is under design, uh, and it is expected to start construction in fall of 2021, and hopefully in service in 2022. So now um, we've received uh, on May 28th the preparation of the notice of the notice of preparation of the environmental impact report for the project level environmental analysis of the project for phase two, which would go from series where series ends um, down to Merced. So I have that on the screen showing the location of where that would go. The um, stop in Turlock is shown uh, consistent with where it was shown in the, the uh, previous EIR. And so this evening, um, what we're looking from council is direction on how to respond to this notice of preparation um, for the environmental impact report. So I'll go through a couple slides to kind of give you the overview, um, and then I'll close with a couple comments and look for any questions you might have. Um, Dan Levitt from ACE is uh, on the call as well as Matt Cranford from the San Luis County Fairgrounds. So. I'll walk through a couple slides. Again, here's the overview showing um, where the stops would be. One thing to note is there's two stops shown, um, Livingston and Atwater, one at each, and ultimately there will be a decision made as to one stop in that location. So it's not one at each, it's one or the other, and that will be a decision that ACE will make at some point through the process. Um, and again, this is just getting started on the project level EIR kind of first step. So what was identified in the previous EIR was a location uh, near our transit center, um, utilizing a portion of the property that is occupied uh, and owned by the state of California and operated by the San Jose County Fair Board. Um, that area uh, is shown there in green with pedestrian crossovers to cross from the transit center um, to a platform uh, in the middle where the trains would stop. So this was um, the, the concept that was identified um, two years ago, 2018, and was adopted as part of the EIR, um, is now continuing uh, as part of the project, um, unless directed or studied in a different alternative. So here's the overall timeline of what uh, ACE is looking for, um, ultimately hoping to provide service in 2025 um, for this phase two. So right now we're in the preliminary stage of the environmental impact report where all the details would be fleshed out as to what uh, the impacts are. Um, and then uh, once the phase one is completed, they move into design and construction of the phase two. Critical piece of information for the public um, is this here. Um, three virtual scoping meetings um, that are being held by ACE to talk about this project. Um, so you can see them on the screen. I'll mention those um, Thursday, June 25th from 3 to 4.30, Thursday, June 25th from 6.30 to 8, and then Tuesday, June 30th from 6.30 to 8. Um, and that's where the uh, ACE will do a presentation with a lot more details than what I showed this evening. This is just a broad overview. Take public comment, and the comment period for uh, this EIR um, for the scoping portion is July 7th. So any comments um, would be due by July 7th. So for um, that, I'll stop right there and see if there's any questions. And I, as I mentioned, uh, we do have folks on the uh, on the line that could assist with any questions. If you have any more than that, we just try to keep it high level. Really, at this point, looking for council direction as to um, what comments, if any, that we should supply on this scoping meeting, um, kind of either confirming that this is the appropriate location or if there's some council direction to do go a different direction. So looking for that or if you, some of the direction you're looking for. So that's where we're at. Look for any questions you may have. So did, did you just say that um, there was a vote previously um, by our council to, to put it at the transit center? So that I don't know. I don't know the history on it. All I know is per the general plan, the general plan designation indicates that the ACE 
uh, commuter rail, it doesn't say a specific, commuter rail should be near the transit center. So my understanding, uh, I don't know how that was taken, that's a history that I'm not aware of, um, is that when the transit center location was chosen as a final location, that because of the general plan policy that was considered that this was consistent with the general plan and the location. Now obviously there's, I, I don't know what the history was, whether a council took a vote or any action. Um, I just know that that was identified in the previous EIR as the location um, and it's continuing based on that information. When, can I chime in? Because I do have that history. Go ahead. Go. So when we were doing the general plan update, what, 15 years ago, that location was identified along with um, one way out in the country down Golden State as two viable options. The Golden State area was not developed and didn't have a parking structure. So they wanted to make sure that all the transit was centrally located around our new transit center that was going to be open and whenever the transit center opened. So that was the decision that I actually, the whole committee that was doing the general plan was involved in to put it there so that we could keep all of our transportation localized in one area. All right, questions for Mr. Wells? Um, I get, I've got a kind of question more for uh, Matt and Dan, I guess. Uh, when, when I first saw the location, I, I had my concerns and my doubts, but uh, I just want to hear from, from uh, Matt. Does this, this look like something that, that would be doable, Matt? Yeah, after having discussions and meetings at the first environmental impact uh, a couple of years ago, as well as meetings this last week, a week and a half, um, we, we are committed to moving forward with it and looking at it. There are some challenges we have operationally with events we have throughout the year and the fair, but we figure with the commuter schedule and the events we have, we can work around them pretty easily. Um, but like uh, City Manager Wells has said, we're in the first stage of it right now. We're still early on. So we're still vetting all those ideas, all those um, potential issues we may have. But myself and the board feel we can move forward with this project pretty well. Okay, thank you. And and Dan, a question for you too is just um, from what I understand, watching the progress of this over the last few years, it looks like things are running a little bit ahead of schedule. Is that is that correct? Well, ahead of when we committed to fully being able to implement the system, but we are absolutely doing everything we can to get trains in um, before. I mean, we had a date that was 2027. We think we'll get trains running to Merced by 2025. But uh, so we are a little bit ahead of schedule um, on that end. Uh, I should just note in terms of the location, um, earlier on when we first started doing studies, we did look at a downtown location um, and in and having conversations with the city uh, a few years ago, really got more convinced that the location of the transit center was a good spot. If you look at what ACE type of service that we offer, we are a commuter based service and we'll be taking commuters to Sacramento and to the Bay Area, and that the location is a pretty central one in terms of access to people who would be traveling north to, to their to the jobs or, or to, to business meetings in either Sacramento or the Bay Area. So we did, and looking at it, I mean, typically uh, we often think about downtowns as being sort of the location where you'd want to have a station, but in the case of Turlock, with the direction that people are headed for this service, it seemed to make a lot of sense to us, and the connectivity looked really good at the transit center. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, what is the parking capacity for uh, for this current location? So the, the previous EIR identified 212 parking spaces. They're currently updating their ridership information as part of the environmental impact report, and they would adjust the actual parking based on that ridership updated information. So it's in that range, but um, as part of the EIR, they would identify the actual numbers of parking. And do you have uh, any estimate as to the distance between uh, riders on or residents on the north end, the northmost end of Turlock to this location versus uh, the series station? 
depending on where they lived and which side of town, if you were kind of a northeast past, you know, east side of Berkeley over in there to get to here, you know, that's probably a 10 to 12, 10 to 15 minute, minute drive, depending on the time of day. Not ACE, obviously, is early morning generally, so you don't yeah. generally have traffic, but I think most people who live in that way would recognize it's about 10 to 15. If you live in that same area and jumped on Taylor at 5 in the morning, ACE station and series are probably about the same time frame, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on where you're at. So that would be decision centrally location kind of between the two would you you know a person would make a decision where they're going to go a little south to go north or go north to go north um that, that that's depending we'll, i think we'll where somebody a, lived we have a cooler transit station so they'll pick ours <laughs> yeah. that's the hope all right we'll open it to the public anyone wishing to uh, speak toward the uh, ace train and where it could or could not be uh placed within our city madam clerk Thank you, Mayor. I have one member of the public with the last name Bridegroom. Mr. Bridegroom. Are you there? Let's, let's see if it works this time. Okay, there you are. Oh, you hear me? Great. Okay. Um, it's kind of a um, related comment. Um, a lot of uh, uh, bus traffic is now going down Dell's Lane. Dells Lane was not built for that, and in fact, one of the uh, transit buses that goes down is from Merced, and it's uh, kind of aggravating. They uh, should, um, instead of going down Dells Lane, which I understand is a um, very quick and short and direct method, it would be much appreciated if a large bus does not go through a residential neighborhood, but instead takes Monta Vista back to Golden State and then goes down to the transit center. I came in person to uh, talk to our transit manager uh, last year, late last year, and um, I kind of thought I would get some support from him, but he kind of blew me off and said, well, well, that's the Merced bus. Um, well, yes, it is the Merced bus, but this is the city of Turlock. Could you please talk to the uh, Merced Transit people and have them reroute the bus so we don't have a bus going through residential neighborhoods? Thank you. Thank you. Another caller, please. A caller with the last name Singh. Caller Singh. Hello? Caller Singh. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, it's Andy Singh. Um, I'm just wondering how the construction of this project would affect local businesses. Mr. Wells. Seeing as it's several years out and we don't know the details of the construction, I don't have an answer for that at this point in time, but that it would be something that would be analyzed as part of the environmental impact report. I don't know if Dan wants to um, chime in there, but that is the purpose for this process is identifying what the impacts are of the project and construction is one of those impacts. And I just suggest that uh, the callers, uh, that business got pretty messed up with putting the median in. They only can get half of the, uh, the gas and, and uh, all that over there in that corner. So any more would probably put them out of business. So we'll have to figure out how, how that works. Yeah, and again, yeah. That, that's an impact of- Toby, this is Dan. Go ahead, Dan. If, I, if I could just add, I mean, you, I think you, what you said is absolutely correct. And that will be a key part of, of the environmental document. But I did want to also just note in addition that uh, for the most part, with the exception of, at, the, at the stations and, and the parking and these type of things, we, we're, we're in the right of way of UP. And this would be for the most that the, we're adding, we're ex extending upon sidings that exist and, and adding additional track within the right of way. So there, there are not a lot of right of way takes through this. There are some at, at stationaries that we need. And that's one thing about the transit center. Again, you've got land, you know, public land that's already kind of there. So for the most part, our, our, this, this uh, proposal has relatively little impacts on, on, on property, but we will be identifying those through the environmental process. Yeah, and we'd recommend the, the caller um, provide comments um, to the notice of preparation. That's the best way to ensure that the comments are addressed. Another caller? Thank you, Mayor. At this time, there are no other callers that would like to address the council on this item. May 
Is there another color? Never, never. I, I have a hand that went up and a hand that went down. <laughs> it was. Cheryl, would you like to address the council regarding this item? Cheryl. <coughs> Cheryl, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I, I just was, I, I don't know a lot about this. So my question is just simply um, for a commuter bus, wouldn't it make more sense that the parking in to catch it was closer to 99, not in town? Commuter Since rail. Is this is a train. Fast? Yeah. This is a commuter train, not not a bus. Okay, so wouldn't it make sense for a commuter train to have to catch closer to ninety nine or not really? Because it's a train, it doesn't matter. Well, the train tracks are already there, so using the existing right of way oh, yeah. is the key. As I'm to, sorry. Yeah, I get it. Sorry. <laughs> Unless you want to help move the tracks, but uh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> bit more expensive. <laughs> Another call. A little slow on the uptake on my part. Sorry. No worries. We got. It. Thanks for calling. The next call. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, there's no other member of the public that would like to address the council. Okay, close it. <laughs> so quick. <laughs> Okay, so bringing it back, I do have some concerns. Um, this is kind of like a flashback for me. Uh, you know, when I first got elected, I was like, oh, I want to bring, you know, revitalize the, the downtown. And nobody uh, was worried about the ACE train. They said it had suggested there, but there's no hurry in it. We're going to have an economic development committee. We're going to do this. And then we just keep moving around with city managers. And, and so here we are. Um, I've always said that it should be down further where we have the opportunity zone between South First and Golden State. There's a ton there to be built up. There would be jobs available, things of that nature, and it would revitalize the downtown. The problem, and I do love the fairgrounds, I should have worn my fairground uh, mask, but there's no guarantee that the governor is going to take care of them. There's no real quality sales tax coming from that. And if people are parking there and they're gonna like, you know, just mess around, they're not gonna grab an Uber and run downtown. So as we're trying to look at things and see how we can reinvest in making sure that we're revitalizing and working on economic development, to me, the logical is to move it down further than to have it there. That's just my belief, what I've been working on since I got here and I feel like I got kind of, forgive me, railroaded to having to have this conversation at this moment because uh, everything if I, I would suggest to you if we brought my economic development committee together they also would tell you it's about putting it where you're going to get your biggest use and you're going to make the most money out of it no disrespect but 10 days a year for the the fair is going to have your nonprofits. you're not making a lot of money now they have other things going on but we don't get a lot from state property so we have to kind of work with what is best for Turlock and creating a revenue that is sustaining our services. So I personally wouldn't want it there. It would went down further. And that's where I, I would have been trying to get that had I had economic development committees. Um, I, I see the, I see the potential value in developing that, that part of downtown for sure. Um, However, I think that there's a key distinction between what this rail is servicing and what the development of something in that area that could resemble a train would be. I think what that might look like is more of a light rail connectivity that's you know down the 15, 20 year plan where people are people that this is this what this is trying to service is the commuters that. Are coming in. What is what is the current hours for the uh, departures and for this? It's like five a.m. Five a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Or, five a.m. Yeah. Yeah. There. This is the the type of uh, user that is not going to be stimulating our the surrounding economic um, the the markets right around there. Um, and also, this is a key part of town that also needs significant revitalization and focus. We have so much underdeveloped land in and surrounding that area that is primed for higher development, affordable housing, uh, Donnelly Park being right there, the transit center being right there, the connectivity from the people, if someone comes from out of town to 
to hop off of there and connect to our transit center and connect to the entirety of the city and not just downtown. So that way our prioritization of economic development fo uh, focuses on equitable economic development. I know that the prioritization of this council uh, from a general plan perspective has been to revitalize downtown and we've spent a good amount of our efforts and energies to get it to where it is now. I do think there's absolutely more opportunity to uh, contribute to some of the parts that are right now are, are blighted and um, um, that have areas with a lot of vacancies, but I see an incredible value for this for being the first entry of the commuter rail in Turlock. Other thoughts? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think this is really exciting. Um, we're able to uh, provide really a whole nother, um, a, 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 to a whole nother workforce. Um, the people who want, who move to Turlock uh, because it's affordable, but do li uh, work in other areas that maybe there that that need the more diverse industry for, for what their career uh, for their career path. This this provides that it connects that. Um, the Central Valley to an area that really doesn't have a real feasible way, an economic way to get there rather than getting into your car and driving on the highway. Um, and there, I'm sure that there, I know that there's people that get on the highway, get on 99 and drive to the Lathrop connection point to take this to the Bay Area uh, for work. So I agree that this is, this fits a very specific demographic of people. I believe it's very, very large uh, that need to be connected to a larger transportation opportunity um, and they are not going to be spending a whole lot of their day necessarily, unless they're coming the other way and they're coming to work here from other areas, which is a whole, another really positive side of that we can consider. Um, th that that group will be spending their time at work. So I can I can understand the there is definitely always a need to be creative and think about uh, 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 economic development in terms of how we can revitalize our certain, our areas. But Turlock's grown. It's this is a very this is the middle of, of of our city. The transit center is right there um, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity surrounding this area and wherever transit centers are built more stuff gets built around it so to have that room around it is really some great I think uh, proactive and also fits very well into uh, to ACE's extension plan so it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity um, the university is close by I think this is going to help a lot of students commuter students that uh, we have a we have a very high percentage of students that are coming from the local area that take 99 to get to school they drive it increases increases parking, it increases parking uh, cars in neighborhoods around the university that people don't like. Uh, so this could actually help a lot of a lot of uh, different uh, uh, community members, um, and I understand that our, our downtown could always could always use more attraction to bring people to it. We're really proud of it, but I think there's going to be a myriad of opportunities down the road where we can do that and not take away something that is a really really good option and a really good uh, 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 connection point to try to fix something else that we uh, think needs to be fixed. Yeah, I just uh, can, can I ask I a like question. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Go. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to know if Dan had any uh, numbers regarding the amount of ridership per stop that we would uh, be servicing. Because I know the goal is to get people off the Ultima. Do we have any of those numbers yet, or is that going to be involved in the EIR? Study. It will be, that will come through the, uh, we, we're, we're working on the ridership forecast. We had some previous forecasts, but we're updating those. And so that will be coming out as part of the EIR. So we'll also, will that include, and maybe this is a Matt question, how many parking spaces are they looking at at the fair? Yes, that, that will be part of it too. Toby mentioned a previous number, but there, there's, there's other, you, you also have parking at the transit center itself and we will be, uh, looking at other opportunities that are right around that area that, that might provide parking as well. And then in addition, I think one thing that we do want to look at, there's a certain amount of parking that we're going to need to do for the first phase of this program. But what we found with ACE is that it's always good to look at opportunities or where you could have future parking when needed, because uh, we've, we've outgrown a number of our parking lots. And so we, we would look for at least looking at options for future areas of, of that would make sense for, for expansion for parking. So, I mean, we could potentially put a parking lot down on, you know, 
I don't know, necessarily think First Street is a good option unless we clean up the homeless and that's our job. But, you know, some other opportunities for us, some other parking lots too that could maybe bring what the mayor is some eco- economic development to downtown. Um, having a business in San Jose like I do, my partner gets on the freeway at 4.30 a.m. and she's home at 9. So, you know, those are the, those are the type of people that we're trying to attract to that ace train but she doesn't want to go out and go shopping after that or go to dinner or whatever so um my next question was what and how are we going to fund the um pedestrian crossing is that through ace train grant funding or is that the city's um you know through the city to figure out how we're going to do that that is part of the funding for the program. Okay. Uh, I don't have any more questions. Council. Yes, just a couple of comments I had is, you know, what, the, what I'm looking at is here, like I said, I had, I had my doubt the first when they proposed this particular location. I wasn't sure that the space was there. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to work in partnership with the fairgrounds and the parking and all the events. But as I, as I get a little bit more information, this is state property. Uh, I don't see any Turlock dollars going into this. Uh, if we try to move it someplace downtown further, uh, I see possible Turlock dollars being spent on some of this. And uh, I don't think we have those dollars to spend at this time. So uh, I look at this, I think, you know, this this will work. If, if Matt and Dan have already gotten together and they looked at this and they said, yeah, we can make this work, um, and that uh, footbridge going over uh, Golden State, to me, it has a great idea, uh, not only for the uh, people using the train in the transit center, but that's a good place. We have foot traffic that still goes across uh, Golden, Gate, Golden State there on Hawkeye, and uh, we've seen some of the incidents that can happen uh, because it's, it's a long cross and... Uh, very uh, very unsafe. So I, I see this as a possible safety uh, uh, concern being addressed right here with that footbridge as well. So yeah, I I can I, I look at this and I'm okay with this right here. Can I ask a couple of questions to piggyback off of what's been said? So on, on the for the footbridge, is there, yeah, pedestrian overpass. Uh, what, at what point does the design piece come into the, all this? <laughs> I know I just see an orange line. Yeah, when so at this point, it's, you know, the environmental impact report, it'll start to get refined through that process so they identify what the impacts are, but the design, you know, wouldn't get into, you know, level of detail until several years after that. Is it, po is it possible for us to work with the art students and stuff like that and make it a, make it a nice little so that, thing? I'd have to I, defer down, to, 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 to Dan. Dan is that how, a Dan? Okay, yeah, so that's process. with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we're gonna be spending money can we make it pretty that's what I'm asking. <laughs> uh, to, and then I'll give you the second question too they're both for you you're talking about expanded parking and stuff like that um, from a land use perspective uh, pr preferences to build up and build parking structures shading and uh, that kind of stuff is that going to be uh, something that we'll be considering here yeah, I would this is Dan again I mean, so we are. We do have some parking structures, but th but they're particularly in the in the Bay Area, in the, in the Valley. I mean, often what happens is, that, as you know, parking structures are pretty expensive, and and so uh, we don't. Have, at this point, we do not have parking structures in the Valley. Uh, that's something that can be looked at in the future, but again, it's just an issue of, of cost, and and so um, we we are in in several locations looking at the possibility of structures. But finding the funding to build them is, is difficult. Where and when you have the land, that does create a situation where it, it, it does make it easier to to, to have it um, at great. Thank you. So if we, okay, got it. Uh, there's some homework and planning that needs yeah. to be done. Yes. Uh, I was say maybe uh, maybe Matt, you can help get him some state dollars for that. Uh, Affordable housing right there next to it. <laughs> <laughs> let's yeah, we're all in line for that one. <laughs> So I just want to reiterate that uh, economic development is about having vision 
Uh, this is the west side. It's about trying to look forward to uh, opportunities. An opportunity zone is there. We have some problematic areas on the west side right there. It would be amazing unless we're saying that those people aren't going to use that, which I don't think we're saying. Um, it, the job that uh, the city manager says right here is to also be economic development. Providing this over to the uh, opportunity for the fairgrounds is not about our economic development in the way it should be. We're supposed to be looking at how we can make this city thrive. And it's not about just downtown, it's about the west side over there, having that area that's completely available and open. And I suggest to you that there are people who own those land, that land or would want to own that land because then they could start to build it out because it's gonna be the new part of the west side that would actually grow and be revitalized. So. I think this is short-sighted. Um, Y'all do what you do, but um, we're here to set vision and try to utilize whatever we can for the betterment of the community. Let's, let's agree that it's different visions versus short-sighted because there's equitable and also there's a complete neglect of the north side of town by putting it on that side, but it's just, yeah. Let's agree to disagree. Well, the transit center is, is already there for the north side of town. I would suggest to you that the west side has not gotten much, and this would be a really great opportunity for them. But um, let's move forward. Uh, you have your, we don't need a vote, so you, you know what you're doing. Yeah, as long as the, yeah, as long as the council um, direction is, is consistent, then we will uh, write a comment letter back to that consistent with what I've heard this evening, make sure any environmental issues are covered through working with planning and engineering. So uh, we'll write that letter and, and provide council a copy of the, the letter. Okay. Uh, we now we have public participation and that is up to three minutes on something and Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the public will be given an opportunity to address the council on items that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council and on any item on tonight's agenda. For items listed on the agenda, we ask that you please defer your comments until the time that item is heard by the council. For those who are interested in addressing the council, you may use the raise your hand feature on your screen, or you may also press star nine from your telephone keypad once the mayor opens public comment and before she closes public comment. Members of the public will be allotted three minutes for comments and comments will be taken in the order of which they appear. When it is a member's turn to speak, their line will be unmuted and that is when their three minutes will begin. Lastly, we request that members who address the council, please state their first and last name in the event that any follow-up is needed. However, that is not mandatory. Okay, let's go with the first caller. I believe uh, we have a list here of 21 people. So who's on it? Thank you, Mayor. The first caller, I have the last name Thomas. Susan Thomas. Check her. I'm here. This is Susan Thomas. I would like to address the mayor. Mayor Bublik, I was one of many who spoke at the last meeting to ask you to withdraw your support of Ted Howes because of the racist and hateful messages he's put forth on his social media. I was very disappointed that you had not one word to say about that issue. If you do continue to support him, then have the courage to stand up and say so, so we know, we can know that you are a person who supports these messages of hate. By saying nothing, you're sending the same message anyway. If you wanna take a stand against racism, then do more than provide some bland words and withdraw your support of his candidacy. candidacy. And shame on you if you continue to remain silent. Thank you for the time. Next caller. Mayor, if I could, before we take more calls, um, I just want to remind callers that this is on uh, this agenda item. If you want to do that at a later time, then, then you can, but it has to be relevant to the agenda item before. This is actually, moment. I'm sorry, Mr. White, this is public participation, sir. Oh, good, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm we did it back. in a, a backwards that. order, so you're good. Okay, if I, may, I have a quick comment before going next. Um, and and Doug, you can you can chime in on here if if I'm off base. But I, I think that uh, one of the things that that our community keeps asking us up here is to stand against uh, racism, hate, and bullying. And I believe some of these calls are on the verge of bullying. I'm not quite sure that uh, that is really acceptable. So, am, am I wrong here, or is it? I mean, I know there's public speech. But this is a, this, when we're sitting up here, 
we are all bipartisan. This is not a political statement. There's no political platforms that, that we're supposed to be working on. And I just want to make sure that the people calling into us remember that, okay? You want us to act one way, have, have a little bit of respect for the people that are up here as well. And uh, let's try to cut out the, the bullying. I mean, if you have a question, ask it. That's fine. But uh, I, I think shaming anybody into anything is, is uh, uh, out, of, out of order, and I don't think there's a, play, there's a need for it at all. So please. Yep. Thank you. And so, Council Member, the only thing I'd probably add to that is I want to remind folks that even in public comment, it's only relevant to items that are before um, the city council or relevant to the city council. Um, a lot of what we're hearing uh, could could be considered political by nature, um, and this is not a political forum. This is a government forum, and so I just want to remind folks that uh, everybody has their First Amendment rights. You can certainly make what you want known known, um, but that being said. Um, even under public participation, it needs to be limited to items that the council can take action on or that are before the council as a whole. So thanks. Thank you. Next caller. The next caller of the last name Sims. Stuart Sims. Hi, actually, this is Lisette Sims oh, calling. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking off a list. Go ahead. Um, I was just calling uh, to voice my concern uh, with the fact that only one city council member was present at the recent Turlock Juneteenth event. Um, it's a really substantial event to have happened in our community, and it's extremely disappointing that our city council, except for one member, thank you, uh, council member Nosrati, uh, it really, I was hoping for our community to really see that our council was with us in that event. And I was extremely disappointed to see otherwise. I'm really hoping that the city council, uh, everyone decides to start to become more active in our community and, and specifically uh, engaging with the communities that are trying to very loudly and peacefully voice their opinions right now and have been receiving a pretty deafening silence. Um, so I'd like to just encourage all of the city council members to reflect on how you can engage with your community uh, right now and ensure them that you are hearing what they have to say and that you are taking into consideration their concerns like I said, right now, it seems like we have a pretty deafening silence and a lot of empty words, um, especially considering the fact that Mayor Blue Black has still not decided to remove her endorsement of Ted Howes. It's just very difficult for us community members to really believe that you stand against racism. Show us, use actions to demonstrate it. Thank you so much. Next caller. The next caller, I have the last name. Varin or Varin? Caller Varin? Hi, this is Donna Varin. And um, I understand what you were saying earlier that this is, that you don't think this is a political um, issue. However, I disagree in that Mayor Blue Black, you are in a position of power for the city of Turlock. And by adding your title to the endorsement of Ted Howes, I think is just appalling. I called into the last city council meeting requesting you reconsider your endorsement of Ted House. And during that meeting, you stated that you would not be addressing this issue until later on. I have yet to see or hear any explanation or retraction of that endorsement. I also mentioned that I had sent you an email considering the same subject and you indicated that you would get back to me. I have since emailed you again and have not yet received a reply. More racist posts have come out that are attributed to House's Facebook account. One in particular on June, July 11th, 2016, he criticized Black Lives Matter and made vile racist remarks about the black community. He has so far insulted and disparaged our Mexican community, our black community, and our Muslim community. This is definitely not the caliber of person I want representing me in Washington or anywhere. And I find it troubling and telling that you have yet to comment on these posts. 
and still endorse an obvious white supremacist. As you endorse this man, I can only conclude that you agree with his statements and thus his morals and beliefs. You have given us nothing to counter this opinion. This is your chance to do the right thing. Thank you very much. That's it. Next caller. The next caller, I have the last name Ensley. Caller Ensley. Good evening, everybody. Um, I have to say thank you very much for wearing your masks. It's uh, a great role model to see our city council people uh, doing what we all need to be doing and um, hopefully making a difference. Um, the Black Lives Matter vigil and march down Gear Road showed that Turlock is home to a diverse and engaged population. People showed up or supported the march from home because we all realize that this is the time for a change in how we interact with and perceive other people. Rejected are the sly or blatant slurs directed at other races, religions, and cultures. Unfortunately, Ted Howes has not received this message. He continued in a third round of defamatory remarks to stir the pot of racial and social prejudice. The people we elect to mayorship or city council are reflections of who we strive to be as a community. More than ever, our community strives to be inclusive and affirm the, affirm the rights of all to participate in democracy. Ms. Boo Black announced in the last city council meeting that she supported Black Lives Matter. I believe her. I believe that she wants the best for our community. However, she hasn't withdrawn her political endorsement printed in the Tracy Press of February 14th or on Facebook pages of Ted Howells. The state and national Republican parties have rejected Mr. Howes. Other local representatives have rejected Mr. Howes. I call on Ms. Boo Black to reject Mr. House's racist comments and withdraw your support as a representative of this city council. Your community and the county are watching to see you do what is correct for our community. Thank you. Good evening. Next caller. Mayor, um, it would it be possible to move up the uh, police department public safety briefing to after public comment to make, I, I think that that will be beneficial for those that are calling in. Would that be permissible? I know we already approved the agenda. We approved the agenda, Mr. White. You up there? Mr. White. I am sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Um, so uh, we can't, we would just need a motion. Well, I, I move you know. to move the uh, city manager report, specifically item B, public de police department, public safety briefing, to before, uh, I'll after. Second it. So okay. Following public participation. Okay. <clears throat> Clerk, call the roll, please. Thank you. Councilmember Ariano? Yes. Councilmember Larson? Yes. Councilmember Nisrati? Yes. Councilmember Scare? Yes. Mayor Bublack? Yes. All right. We'll continue with the callers, please. Thank you. The next caller, I have the name Debbie. Caller Debbie. Hi. Good. Good. Good evening. Um, I'm listening to a, a lot of um, people that are involved with Be the Change. You want our mayor to distance herself from Ted House. I will ask Andrew Nostrati and possibly uh, Nicole Larson to please distance yourself from Be the Change. Uh, that being said. On D-Day, which I brought up two weeks ago, Ted honored our veterans. He um, supports freedom. Now, I went to Josh Harder's website, who is behind this Be the Change, and he's all about fighting for social justice. Um, I think that's the beauty of being an American. We all have the ability, like I said previously, two weeks ago, 
we will all go to the polls in November and we'll make a decision and it will be an informed decision. So let's make this about making Turlock a better place to live as opposed to be the change in the political activism that is being presented from the dais. I'm tired of it. Secondly, I have a question. We've had five, I think, five events since um, this event has occurred. No one has ever mentioned David Dorn, who was killed by a black man. No one has ever mentioned Patrick Underwood, who was killed in Oakland, California. And these are these were people that were representing us. They were black. They were shot. They were killed. We understand George Floyd was a terrible tragedy. Nobody disputes that. But this has to end in our community now. Now, my question to our chief is how much has it cost the city of Turlock to pull together protection for this be the change activity that Andrew Nascrati has been behind. I, I would like an answer tonight. Thank you very much. Next caller. The next caller, I have Ms. Shaver. Ms. Shaver. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes, yes, I've worked out my technical difficulties. Thank you very much. I have a very quick question. I am calling because at the end of the um, consent agenda, after item 6U, it says, note, the sales tax measure will be considered by the city council on July 6, 2020 at 5 p.m. My question is, I was under the distinct impression that that particular day, July 6th, is the day that that sales tax measure is due at the County Board of Supervisors. So if it's due on July 6th, why would we be having a meeting about the sales tax, sales tax measure that day at 5 p.m.? It sounds to me as though that's too late to submit it to the County Board of Supervisors for the November ballot. Will you please let me know if I'm misunderstanding? Thank you. So we've requested and received an extension of that deadline. Um, action on July 6th would be transmitted to the county on July 7th, and they had accepted that um, with the caveat that of the items that are on the agenda this evening for our other ballot measures would be uh, for council consideration, assuming those are approved, that meets all of those deadlines and the sales tax measure, if council directed, would still be within the consistent deadlines that the county needs to meet the publishing of their agenda for that next week, the 14th. Next caller. The next caller of the last four digits, 5377. Caller 5377. One second. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Marie. Um, I just think all these calls and stuff are distracting from our city and what's going on. And like you've all said before, um, Mr. Gill did and Mr. White did, the bullying needs to stop. This isn't the time to address this. We have bigger issues to worry about. And if we want to talk about bullying, then let's talk about Andrew and his issue with a bunch of patriots that did the same thing, okay? What's good for one is good for the other. So it all needs to stop. Whatever Mr. House did in the past, he did in the past. I don't believe any of it. I don't. I think there was underlining issues in that. I think people have Photoshopped things, and it all needs to quit. So stop the bullying. We don't have time for this. If that's how these calls are going to keep going, that's wrong. It's a waste of time. 
and it's a waste of, it's dividing our city. This isn't the city I was born and raised in. And by the way, I grew up on the west side. We didn't do this kind of stuff. We sat down and we talked and we worked things out. But like Debbie said, in November, we'll settle this once and for all. So it needs to stop now. Thank you. Next caller. The next caller with the last four digits, 1630. Caller 1630. Hi, this is Mary Jackson. I kind of, are you there? Can you hear me, I hope? Yes. I am calling because I'm a bit confused why the public comment period was moved to the end of the meeting. So I would like an explanation and timeline of how this happened via email, please. Amy, I have a problem with your lack of communication. I have texted, emailed, and called you on various matters out of what I consider a courtesy on serious city issues. I have never received any communication communication back from you in any of these three forms. Let me remind you, we ran for city council three times and served together with Ted House for two years. You were elected to represent every citizen, our entire community, not just the ones you agree with. I am pointing this out because several weeks ago, this is what sort of annoyed me to the end of first not communicating and now this. A gentleman spoke about breaking city policy and using the city state skate park. From my recollection, you told him you were more than happy to meet with him to discuss that situation. As the parent of children who would love to use our city parks, but don't because we follow the rules, it annoyed me. We have many children, especially the ones that need the water parks right now that are not open. 21 people spoke out directly to you at the last city council meeting about your continued endorsement of Ted House for Congress. You didn't offer to meet with any of them, but you can meet with the man who is breaking city rules at the skate park. Ironically, I just ran into Mr. House while shopping last week. I am not sure who was more surprised, him or me, since I haven't seen him out and about in 15 years and he lives in a gated community in Stockton. My point is this. There's always been politicking done on the dais, and when I sat on that dais, I did my best to make sure to not allow it to happen. And so my point is, I'm going to go back to communications. You've limited the amount of time we can speak, and now you're trying to tell people that they can't give you their opinion. So it's okay for one side, but not the other. Why am I, this is why I'm questioning the repositioning of public comments from the beginning of the meeting until the end. If you think this issue of the endorsement of Ted House is going to go away, it's not, and it needs to be addressed. And yes, we will have an election in November. But, in, but people always have the right to speak out. And more importantly, you need to put your first name and your last name. Everyone. We all follow the same rules. Thank you. Next caller. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, there are no other members of the public that would like to address the council during public participation. Oh. Hmm. Except that. I have a hand that's gone up and gone down and back up again for the name Barbara. Barbara, would you like to address the council? Barbara, you there? Barbara's not there. Thank you, Mayor. There's no other members of the public. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to uh, the next item being in our council comments. Is that correct? Which one? I'm sorry. Which one did you want? Oh, okay. My bad. My bad. Okay. So we're going to do uh, fire department first, I guess. You just want police. Oh, okay. Chief? I know, right? And I'm getting blamed. And if I could say a couple words before. Uh, before our chief starts uh, talking about his briefing, I wanted to kind of talk to, and I'm really uh, addressing some of the things that have uh, come come from our community over the last month. 
um, to give some background to this. Uh, so our chief is going to go into, uh, and also the, the emails and the, the types of communication that he's received from our community on the same, on the, uh, of the same issues. Um, George Floyd's death did create significant rightful civil unrest in our community. And from the amount of, I've lived here my entire life. I went to high school here. I went to college here uh, and I'm still here. And I've never seen this level of pot of, a peaceful engagement at, at a, a, a protesting level that our community has seen. And I think that goes hand in hand, not only with what our community represents and those individuals that did uh, want to uh, share their voice and their thoughts a about the, the, the national conversation that's take place, but it also speaks to our uh, community-oriented policing that our police department has prioritized and has uh, led through excellence, truly, throughout this process. Um, there was, I know that there was some calls for uh, proclamations, resolutions, things along that, and I, I actually did write one. Um, to, and after communicating, due to the Brown Act, we were not, uh, you know, communicating with other council members on an, on an issue is illegal. So after talking with staff and our police chief, I found that it is better to lead with action rather than just words. Um, and also having a conversation with our mayor and her experiences as a police officer in various areas, there's a lot to be done and a lot of action that can be done in terms of bringing our community uh, to a place of, of overview of, of our operations. Uh, so the chief is going to go into um, some, some really great uh, initiatives that we can come forward out of, out of this national conversation, such as a community advisory committee to the chief. Um, as well as talking about uh, the uh, kind of the p policies that have been brought up through the eight can't wait movement and really how the city of Turlock and the Turlock Police Department has actually addressed all of these. I know that the website where, the, where these um, uh, uh, pieces of, of, of policy are found say that we don't, but we actually do. I don't know how, what their uh, metric is for, for obtaining that information. Um, but I wanted to uh, say that before our, our Chief Nino Amafar starts talking because that's kind of how these, uh, some of the things that he is going to be talking about was brought up. It's, it was a collaborative effort. It was uh, representing that us at the dais, we are listening, we're present. Some of us have been present and walked along our community members' vigils and things like that uh, to address the civil unrest and the, the rightful one of the tragedy that happened to George Floyd. It's happening on a national level, and these conversations, I hope, are continued. That's why I wanted to put into, and with the collaboration of staff, a, uh, a, a foundation that, continue, that, that will always continue that conversation through a committee advisory uh, committee, community advisory committee composed of community members. Um, so without further ado, uh, Chief, thank you so much. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Larson, thank you very much. Uh, before I go into uh, the discussions that I'd like to bring forward, um, we do have a written report of our monthly statistics that is available to each of you there and also to our viewing public. It will be uh, made available on our social media and website as everything else is. Um, so having said that, I do want to indicate on our monthly report, and it says it right on it, with COVID-19, we've seen a drastic drop in a lot of our crimes uh, simply because of um, you know people stay at home, businesses closed, and so forth, but as we open up, we are seeing an increase in um, several of the other types of crimes, assaults and batteries and so forth. So with that, I wanted to point that out because I don't want you at the end of the year to say, oh, you had a 15% drop in uh, May and June. What happened? What did you do? We didn't do anything. <laughs> it was just people were locked up, basically. So having said that, I also want to answer one of the questions of the callers that called in about the cost to the uh, police department. So I had uh, started running the cost after the last council meeting where someone called in and said $200,000. Um, no, maybe countywide. I, I can't, you know, $200,000, that's quite a bit of money. And I, I can tell you that we received quite a bit of help from the sheriff's department. Series Police Department, California Highway Patrol. So I can't tell you their costs, but I can tell you ours. So totally so far, uh, and this is an estimate, 
the best of our abilities with my uh, business manager, uh, $47,305.29. So it's an estimate, but we got it pretty close. Those were a total of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, incidences and protests. Um, so that's what it cost. Um, I, I've got to tell you, I've been doing law. I've been in law enforcement for 31 and a half years. I have seen the ugly side of activities that have engaged individuals of color being injured by law enforcement. Um, we have learned quite a bit, and the, the learning curve continues. California is ahead of the game, and I know you're going to have people in Colorado and in New York say, no, we've got it. I'm sorry, but California is ahead of the game. Um, the, the eight can't wait movement. Um, I put out a document that clearly indicated that we had not only made changes, continue to make changes, our carotid restraint, uh, people call it a chokehold, it's not a chokehold. Nobody is choked. It's a carotid restraint where it limits the flow of blood to the brain and people pass out. That's a last resort before deadly force. But we stopped it. I basically deauthorized it um, before anyone else in, in this county did. And um, it was important to me. I brought that discussion up with my captains. Hey, I want, let's cut this out. We had to wait for post. We were going to check with California Peace Officer Standard and Training because it was an authorized um, use of uh, restraint. It was kind of interesting because three hours later, they sent an email to all agencies that they were decertifying the course. So we were ahead of the game. Uh, having said that, we continue to update our policies and our procedures. Our current policy use of force, again, has been updated. Um, and we are in compliance with everything on the use of force in regards to eight can't wait. Uh, there are some comments in regards to shooting at a vehicle. I will tell you, uh, we cannot limit that. We cannot throw that out completely. And you can just look at the mass uh, attacks in regards to utilizing a vehicle. Look at Charlotte. Um, if law enforcement is there and they have a threat from a vehicle, we have to be able to engage that threat to protect life. Do we do it? The last time we had to use deadly force when a person was in a vehicle was a kidnapping about 15 years ago where we ended up uh, having to shoot the tires out of the vehicle because it got stuck in the field and uh, he was trying to leave with the female he had kidnapped. Once we did that, we were able to successfully rescue her. So it's very rarely used, but it's got to be a tool. And that's what we're talking about, tools. Uh, so moving forward, community policing. I've, that has been my, um, it's been my heart to bring that back into play. Um, and we've done it at the police department. Since 2016, I started programs and um, proactive programs, moving towards more and more community policing, getting more and more information out to our general public, trying to be as t transparent as possible, trying to build collaboration and trust. And I am I believe we've done a good job. I'm hoping that the community is happy with their law enforcement, but that's not enough. Um, community policing requires us to be proactive, not reactive. Unfortunately, because of budget constraints, and we all know where we're at, we are reactive. However, the last aspect of our community policing, as Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis, did I get it right? Yes, Jeffrey Lewis. Um, his comment at the last council meeting when he turned and looked at me caught me a little off guard when he talked about the community advisory board and I stuck my thumb up, yes, um, because we had discussed it. Um, it's part of the plan. It's actually an International Association of Chiefs of Police discussions in regards to community uh, or citizen advisory board. That's what they use or citizen advisory commission. I'm not looking at a commission. I'm not looking at someone uh, overseeing the Turlock Police Department. We have a very good command staff and um, we keep an eye on all of our staff and we hold everyone accountable and we expect our officers to hold each other accountable. 
Uh, it's in our policy. They shall report. It's, it's not an if or a may. They shall report. So the accountability is there. Having said that, I want to move forward with a community advisory uh, board or committee to the chief of police. I want a different lens. I want a different view. I want a different bias view of what we do, whether it's crime trends, whether it's review of policies or new policies. Having that ability to have a, a different view of it, give suggestions, give comments, and allow us to continue to collaborate and build that trust is huge. It's not only in the crime trends, it's not only in our policies, but review of citizens' complaints. You know, it's interesting when people, uh, Modesto B just asked for, hey, we wanna know how many citizens' complaints came in. Well, they're gonna be a little surprised because we have citizen complaints, which we label CC, and then we have our internal investigations. Well, we have a lot more that we look at ourselves because it's self-report. So it, it was an interesting uh, comment that we received back. Really? I thought it was just internal investigations. No, we break it up. So I want this board to be able to look at these. Obviously, I'm going to pull the names out because it's personnel documents. Uh, there'll be no names, but they'll get to see the full picture of what we get per 832 of the penal code, 832.5 actually, we must have a process in place to accept complaints. But you know what? I'd like my board, my committee to take a look at those and see what we see and maybe come up with some suggestions. You know what? You may be missing something here or we can do better here. So it's all about trust. It's all about collaboration. It's all about transparency. We've done everything we can to be transparent. Every single document I present here is online. All of our use of forces are online. All of our annual reports are online. Our daily reports are online. Our monthly stat reports to the city council is online. Uh, and then we will have reports monthly from our meetings from this commission on what we discussed, what the views were, and some of the changes that may be coming forward or some of the positives that we've done. So having said that, um, I'm pretty excited. I know my term is short, and people say, well, when are you gonna start slowing down? I'm not. You asked about, can this department go without a chief? You can do it for a year because of the two captains we have, Captain Steve Williams and Captain Miguel Pacheco. We'll get this started, and they will move it forward. And this should be the final puzzle of our community policing community outreach, proactive um, activities that our department needs to get back into. Our community expects it. Our community really loves what we do when we're in the proactive mode. So we'll be coming back. Uh, I will have a procedure or application process. I want to have between 9 to 11. And uh, it's kind of funny. You're probably saying 911. Exactly. <laughs> Nine to 11 people, that's exactly why I came up with it. I don't want something too small, but I don't want something too big that it's difficult to manage and we can't get work done. So I want to do that and I want to have a diverse group. I want individuals that are from the college. I want our business uh, individuals that want to apply. I want our community members that are part of our neighborhood watch program or our business watch, our school districts. People that, uh, Jolyn DeGrazi would be a perfect one to grab from the west side. Um, I want Jeffrey Lewis to be on it with me and uh, we'll work together to establish a process, an application process. It is not something that can be uh, appointed from a council. This must not be political, number one, can't be. Um, politics can't have a portion in this. This has to be we the people for the people and I'm not being cliche, but it's, it's a fact. The police department is the people. And when we forget that, we have what happened in Minneapolis. You're not above the law, you're here for the law, and the people are the law. Not the man wearing, or woman, excuse me, wearing the badge. We're just carrying the weight of the community on our shoulders, because that's what we wanna do. So I'm hoping that this uh, commission does great work, and I'm hoping you see some even larger um, changes in how we do our job here at the police department. And I will tell you, on, under Cal Chiefs, 
we're working diligently to make even more changes besides what we do here in Turlock. Also, just for your information, SB uh, 1412 is the required release of use of force where, or internal investigations where an officer has used deadly force, um, there was a complaint regarding uh, sexual abuse, et cetera. That's all online. All of that stuff's online. All of our policies are online. So we continue to develop, and this council has been instrumental in moving forward with our computer-aided dispatch records management system because our requirements to report to the state on racial profiling is coming up in 2022. And without these electronic systems, it would be almost impossible. So having said that, the big deal here is Mr. Floyd's murder is not in vain. Every person wearing a badge knows that they cannot allow any other person wearing a badge to do anything that is not legal, period. They must take action. They must stop it. They must prevent it. And our training here, not only in Turlock, but in our state, mandates that. You don't get to do anything just because you wear a badge. If that's why you put the badge on, then you need to let it go. And I will tell you, we do the best we can when we try to hire law enforcement. I can only speak for Turlock. I will use the five that are in the academy now. That is out of a group of almost 400 applicants. Those are the five that passed every grueling exam and a complete background to the point where we went all the way back to their neighborhoods when they were kids. They went through a psychological. Is it perfect? No, it is not. It is not perfect. But the overreaching portion of that is your administrators, your police administrators, your chief of police, the buck stops with him or her your captains, your lieutenants, your sergeants, and each individual officer. Checks and balances are there. So we do everything we can to ensure that this community can trust us and knows who we are by first name. And hopefully it never happens in Turlock, but if it ever does, it will be handled immediately. So with that, I, I hope I was able to give a, a, a briefing enough that satisfies everyone. But I will tell you this, um, all of these events that I spoke of that we provided uh, police services for, I've, I've received a lot of comments that, you know, why didn't they put in for permits? The First Amendment allows a peaceful assembly, the right to assemble peacefully. It is our responsibility as police officers and firefighters to provide for the safety of this community. It doesn't matter whether you agree with what someone is doing as long as it's legal. And the First Amendment says it is. So we will provide for the safety of the individuals. And it's their right. Um, so hopefully I've answered all your questions. And I'm open to any other questions. Bob? Were you going to tell us about the uh, body cameras? And sure. Um, <laughs> boy, technology is a is a little bit of a pain. I wish there was more transparency there. Uh, we've had some issues with the brand new body cameras. Um, part of it was we met with the community members for policy, as I stated here, and, and they had a lot of input. Uh, but by the time we got the body cameras in, we realized uh, there was quite a bit more policy we had to write because I have everything turning on automatically. If they turn the police car lights on, it activates the body cameras. If they remove their gun from their holster, it activates the body cameras. If they remove their taser from their holster, it activates the body cameras. If they turn their taser on, it activates the body cameras. So before we knew it, all the body cameras were on. Uh, so yeah, it's been a problem. So we're hoping to be live with the body cameras um, by the end, middle to end of July. The other portion of it is the computer-aided dispatch, when officers get sent to a call, it's automatically going to attach to the body camera footage. And so we're, we're getting that interface completed. And so those are all being done along with the upload capabilities. Uh, we needed more bandwidth, and that's also uh, happening. So hopefully I answered your question. Um, 
technology's coming and we're moving along and it goes right to transparency again. It's going to be neat when I can pull up that body camera when they're at a demonstration and I can see everything. Uh, the Walmart incident, that lady that recorded, she called me. The reason she recorded, she wanted to protect the officers because the individual who didn't have the two kids, we'll just leave it at that because I don't want that business calling me, uh, she felt he was extremely upset and she feared for the officer. That's why she recorded it. But I'm very proud of what our staff did and uh, that is indicative of what you can expect from our law enforcement who's here for the community. We will always explain ourselves. And if we don't, I will explain it and make sure that everyone knows what we did. And uh, that officer did right. So a little too much talking probably, but uh, you asked me to talk. <laughs> Appreciate that. There's a final, final with, we're just wrapping up in the last next couple weeks for the Presidential Commission on Law Enforcement, which is historical. It ha hasn't had since 1965. Um, and so we, we had a lot of things done and then the president took uh, some of it and already has announced it. So we kind of had to kind of step back a little bit and move forward again. Uh, community policing is a huge issue to the board. And so there are things discussed such as whether or not we should be, uh, the police department should be funded for their media so that they get all the great stories out there because typically you only hear the bad things. So, I mean, there's many, many other things going on, but it's exciting and it's uh, interesting to see how the impact of one incident, you, you have to completely revert where you're going and go forward. So I, it's been an uh, amazing honor to, to serve on that, and I'll be able to give the final final once we I know what that is. Any uh, questions, comments for the chief? Uh, Can I ask you a question? Yes. You go question first. I'll go comment. Okay. Um, so I was reading through the report of what happened with Mr. Floyd, and the officers actually, or the officer that was involved, had a pretty lengthy um uh personnel history and i just wanted maybe the chief to speak to that a little bit because i know that he addresses things immediately when things come across his desk or his you know sergeants and captains do with regards to personnel matters and i as a business owner if i had someone with you know 10 or 12 complaints, that would signal to me that they were probably in the wrong profession. But I maybe wanted to talk to the chief about that because I know that he's been completely proactive in making sure that the people that are working for the city of Turlock have the utmost ethics and morals and responsibilities to the community. So if maybe he could address that a little bit. Chief? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I mentioned California Police Chiefs Association is working uh, very closely uh, to bring additional legislation forward. You will note that there were comments made that officers can leave one agency and go to another. Um, our backgrounds, I can tell you, I can only speak for Turlock, but our backgrounds are governed by Peace Officer Standard and Training State of California, which receives its authority through the California Penal Code. So they have full authority to conduct their own uh, requirements of each law enforcement agency. So having said that, we're hoping that legislation does come forward soon that uh, if an individual is in an investigation, they cannot just simply leave that agency and that investigation stops. You've, you've got to finish the investigation. Uh, granted, you would not be able to take any action against the individual, but that investigation would have been completed and you would have that information. So. We do monitor our complaints. We do ensure that the individual complaints do not continually reoccur with an individual officer. That's a red flag. So if we've got, you know, I'm just gonna, I, we don't have it, thank God, uh, but we have an officer that's had four complaints of use of force. We're gonna look really hard at that, you know, because each complaint is a different individual, but we will look for commonalities there. And we may not have found sufficient cause on one or two or three, depending on what was going on. But if we see a pattern developing, uh, that's where you need to deal with it. Now, there's software out there that does that for you. There are some agencies that have that software. 
Um, it's expensive, but we're not big enough to do that yet, and we're not receiving really that many complaints that we can do that. Um, but we do keep an eye on it, uh, Council Member Ariano. We monitor it, and it's not only me, uh, both captains monitor it, and actually I'm sent out a copy of all the complaints we've had for the last, uh, back to 2015, to the Modesto B who will be putting something out. I couldn't go back any further because it wasn't being kept that long. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. We do stay on top of it. We do monitor it. We do look for inconsistencies of individuals along with patterns. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to speak to one, first off, uh, going through this period um, at every turn with every interaction of everyone in our community, I'm becoming more and more proud of this town and the way that they've handled it. Um, we're, we are truly honored to have uh, a leader like Chief Amherfar uh, leading this department. Um, I know that not too long ago I was uh, uh, someone that would, took to the streets and was angry at plenty of things um, like, like many people have in the last, um, in the last couple months here. And um, my perspective on so many things has changed because of the level of engagement and my dedication to understanding. Uh, of every person that I come across. And that's something that um, with every person that I talk to in our community and with everyone uh, that's working for this city and all of our colleagues here, uh, I continue to make a commitment towards. And I know that every single one of us is in different parts of our lives and different levels of understanding of everything. Um, but that commitment that we have in this community and, um, you know, it's, it's that that moral fiber that runs through this town and the values that everyone on Turlock grows up on is what makes this town uh, unique and some what I believe allows us to be role models to the nation as we handle the complications associated with with, with society. It's gonna get it's gonna get messy at times. There's gonna be people that represent the worst of a community, the worst part of an individual that come to surface. Um, but what, you know, what, I, what I've seen every single day and every single interaction has just given me so much hope and optimism for the future of this town and for this nation. And uh, I know that there's stories like ours all over this country. Um, yeah, I I'm, I'm truly am honored to have been given the chance to be a council member during your term i wish i could have had you through the, the rest i'm sure we'll be we'll we'll be, have someone great that follows suit but i really do appreciate everything you've done and the proactive uh, your dedication to increasing that level of trust um, and working with our community so i really do appreciate everything you've done okay so did you guys expect we're going to just do covid too while we're here You all right with it? Yeah. Okay. Chief? I know. <laughs> okay, so COVID update. Um, again, we're following guidance by Governor Newsom, and the latest thing, as everybody knows, is the face masks. Um, much like the when the reopening, we're doing education, education, education. It's not our intent to find. We're not looking to do that. We don't want to do that. We are educating people on the benefits, but it is the guidance right now. Um, so recent studies, again, from the CDC have, are showing that it does reduce the spread of the virus. So as it is now, I recommend to everybody, when you can't social distance, in accordance with the guidance, Wear your face coverings. You can visit uh, covid19.ca.gov and it will spell out for you who is exempt, who is not, when you need to be wearing them, and when you don't. So with that, the, the trends over the past few weeks are showing increase in the virus throughout the county, and they're going up quite a bit. Two weeks ago, 
when I gave you the report, there were 991 confirmed cases in Stanislaus County. As of today, there's 1,714, so a 73% increase in the county in two weeks. However, Turlock, who initially had a spike, we've only gone up by 17%. So our citizens are doing a good job. I mean, we are, you know, beating the trend in, in that in that category. So I, we, I know we had a caller call in earlier about the spikes. They are definitely going up, but Turlock is doing better than the rest of the county right now. Um, one metric I, I really do look at is the um, availability of the hospital space, because that's, that's an important metric, you know. And there has been a slight uptick in the last two weeks over that, but again, they're still both the regular hospital beds and the ICU beds are about 55%, so there is still enough for, for a surge at this point. So again, just reminding everybody to socially distance, wash your hands, do all the things that we've been doing and continue to do them. Also, as a result of the increase in the cases, the uh, county EOC has gone back to a level one, which is the highest level. Uh, this time they're focusing more on the, the contact tracing, logistics, and messaging. So that's what you'll see. Um, your local EOC is still in effect. We are monitoring, we are assisting the county as we can. So, and we will, we will remain open in, in forms until the, um, until the end of the emergency declaration. So again, none of us want to go back a step. So the face coverings are the new thing to help prevent it. It is working. We want to keep things open. Uh, one piece of news that um, as of next Monday, tentatively, Turlock is going to have a testing site set up at the Rube Bosch Center. Uh, It'll be moving from Patterson to Turlock, so it'll be more convenient if people want to get tested or need to get tested if they're uh, follow, having symptoms. You can make an appointment there by appointment um, on the uh, county, Stanislaus County COVID site, the HSA, HSA site. So you follow the link and you can get an appointment that way. So as far as finance, it hasn't changed a whole lot since in the last two weeks. Um, out of the money that was allocated, you know, we spent $228,000. It's only a slight increase of 4,000 in personnel, 5,000 in supply, and then we had some legal fees come in um, that we missed. So we are still well under the 500,000 and, and it's really slowing down from what we are spending through that. Uh, we have worked over 7,400 hours attributed in our 214s to COVID. So it's been a long, it's been a marathon, not a sprint. It's gonna continue to be that way. And so, um, again, with the CARES money and things like that, we'll be diligent in making sure we get everything back. And as I stated, statistics, um, again, 1,714 cases in Stanislaus County today with 38 deaths, 1,250 people having been recovered, and 23,830 negative tests. So Stanislaus County's testing about, out of all the people being tested, about 6.7% of, of those tested are positive. So with that, uh, Mr. Wells, if there's anything you'd like to add that I missed. Just the, the one thing um, I mentioned, uh, the state, uh, potential for state CARES money under COVID, and one of the items on the budget bill is uh, the governor was given the discretion to um, withhold funds to counties that uh, disregard the state order. So um, if people are wondering why um, we've been consistent with the state order and following those directions, that's one of the reasons. So um, that's not an important uh, reference and part of our budget discussion on the availability of those funds and knowing what's happening at the state level um, and what we continue to monitor at our um, county level as well. Um, you know, this is a fluid situation. It continually changes, but it's obviously trying to stay in tune with what's happening and man my managing what's going on here locally. Um, as uh, Chief Carlson indicated, the um, numbers for Turlock are relatively low rather relative to our population for other agencies. And so that's important to note. But I, I mentioned that just so that our citizens remember, as I look at council members wearing the masks, um, that that is important. If we message the, the common thought process of we don't want to go backwards. Um, so if it's a choice between keeping our businesses open um, and continuing to move our, our economy forward and wearing a face covering. Uh, no one in here is going to argue that they like wearing a face covering, but given that choice, I think it's a pretty easy choice. So just wanted to reiterate that. 
Would you like me to go through my public safety side of this too, since we're doing Certainly. all the briefings? Okay, Please. so I do have a written briefing, but I um, want to do a quick like update on fireworks on the 4th of July oh, yes. that's, that's coming up. Um, we anticipate the 4th of July to be very busy this year. There's no event at the college. Uh, it's on a Saturday. People have got some uh, COVID fatigue. They want to get out. They want to celebrate. And historically, the fire department leading up to the week of the 4th of July is the busiest week for our department, with the 4th of July being usually pretty bonkers for us. So with that, um, in the last few years have been, you know, the council has had, had really addressed concerns with um, illegal fireworks that have been going off. And I know you've already heard them going off. Uh, and um, Nina will speak to this also in a second. This week, uh, this leading up to the 4th of July, we will be looking for illegal fireworks. We will be issuing administrative citations for illegal fireworks if we find them. Um, so with that, uh, just people should know that they will be out there. You may get a, you know, if we can attribute that to your address, you will be receiving an administrative citation. Um, they, I can speak from experience being here a long time, they do start fires. They start roof fires. They start fires every year attributed to illegal fireworks. So please, as you celebrate, use the safe and sane fireworks. There are some tips that we'll be putting on our website for everybody because those two can cause fires and every year they do as well. Um, you know, there are some easy safety tips. You know, you always want to have an adult. You always to help you light them off. You need a, a water supply with you, whether it's a hose or a bucket. You know, use them in the manner that they are supposed to be used. You know, if you, even just because they're safe and sane doesn't mean you should tape a whole bunch of them together, tape them to your cat and then light them off. I mean. Things like that, you know, you use them as they are supposed to be used. Um, Can we uh, edit that? He had to mention <laughs> cat. He had to mention <laughs> cat. Okay. And so, okay, so, uh, exactly. So with, with that, um, we'll be putting up some, some uh, important tips on our website. One other thing just to mention, because every year this starts a fire, and it kind of looks me, people will do their firework display, light it off, they'll know, throw their fireworks in one of their trash bins, the blue one, the green one, whatever, thinking that it's out, they'll put it up against their house, and every year there is a fire, a house fire started because of that. It's the, you know, they go to sleep, it smolders, it burns the trash can, it burns up the side of their house and into their house. And that, for the, at least the last three years, I, I know that that's been a factor. So again, that'll be up on our, on our social media with any tips. Um, just wanna wish everybody a great, Fourth of July holiday season, but um, be safe and, and use things in the manner that are appropriate. So, so real quick, um, yes, ma'am. If people are hearing them and they see them and they want to complain, how are we handling that? Are we telling anybody? Are we just going to roll rover around and see it? You want to? Are you guys wiping that off before you hand it back and forth? We washed our hands. Be we washed our hands before we were okay, handing it back and forth, but we're more than six feet apart, so we should be fine. Uh, in regards to uh, Mayor, you're you're absolutely correct. Um, if we have any of our community members seeing them, hearing them, and they can identify the location it's coming from, and they're willing to let us know about it, six six eight twelve hundred non emergency line. Um, and remember. When they call that, they're going to, we're going to be inundated. Last 4th of July in the 24-hour period, we had over 600 calls for service. Uh, those were dispatched calls. That's not the calls coming in. You can probably quadruple that number. So we will be inundated during the 4th of July, but it's already going on. It, it just seems to never stop. This year is the worst ever. Uh, and I'll say that again. Well, no, I won't say it again next year. Somebody else will. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is, is two years ago, fire and police came together and we asked for the municipal code to be rewritten. And it gave us the ability to write administration sites. Uh, $100, $200, and five, $250, and $500. So for your first offense, it's $100, $250 for the second offense. What that means is that if you've done it three times in a row, you're getting $500 ticket. Um, so that's what it means. So what I want to put forth is is 
besides what the fire department is doing, we're also going to be looking for these during uh, closer to the 4th of July. And working with Turlock Associated Police Officers, I made a Facebook posting. Many of you may have seen it. But the officers work a 411 shift, four shifts at 11 hours. They work more than 11 hours. But what it works out to is, is it gives us eight nine-hour days. I said nine eight-hour days on the Facebook. I made a mistake. It's eight nine-hour days. Well, we use that for training. That was the whole purpose of the 411. More officers out, uh, more coverage. And then we have these days we can assign to training. And we reserve several of those days for the fair to lower our overtime. Turlock Associated Police Officers have worked with me and they have agreed to allow those days to be moved from the fair and we will have uh, additional officers working um, before and after the 4th of July and their sole purpose is going to be looking for illegal fireworks. So I wanna remind those that are going to be using illegal fireworks. We're gonna have cops out there. They're gonna be unmarked, they may be marked you may see them, you may not, but you may get a ticket in the mail. And for homeowners and property owners, you're responsible for those that are lighting it off on your property. So it's not only the person that's visiting you that's lighting it off. If you are a homeowner or you're a property owner and your renter is doing it or your guest is doing it, you're going to get a ticket and it's going to be mailed to you. And uh, I'm hoping by next year we can change the administrative sites to something like they're doing in San Luis Obispo, you know, I would like to see them at 500, 1,000, and 2,000. It's not about the money. It is not about the money. It is about the individual making the right choice, and now we're going to hit them in their pocketbook. That's where it's at. Because even if we write 10 $2,000 tickets, that's $20,000. The amount of time that is going to be uh, expensed there far outweighs that money. So I just don't want them lighting them off. And like the fire chief said, besides the fires, there's dangers to our animals. The dogs and cats are going nuts. Uh, how about our veterans? It's impacting them with uh, the PTSD. Um, it's creating those problems. And then there, there are other issues in regards to hurting themselves, hurting kids. It's, it's just too much going on. So that's what we're doing, and I want to thank again the Turlock Associated Police Officers because we couldn't do it without them agreeing to it, and it's going to cost the city nothing to have all those extra officers out there. Um, so that's what we're doing this year. Let's see if it works. All right. So those are our updates. Um, you've, you're good. You got yours in. Uh, let's go backwards. Uh, item number five, there are none, so we're on the consent item. Are there any items to be pulled? No, nope. Councilmember Ariano, anything to pull? No, I'm good. All right, then I need a motion, please, someone. We have a motion. And a second down, Councilmember Larson. Quick call the roll, please. Adopting the consent calendar, Councilmember Ariano. Yes. Councilmember Larson. Yes. Councilmember Nizrati. Yes. Council Member Esquer? Yes. Mayor Blue Black? Yes. Passes 5 0. Thank you. Final readings there are none. Public hearings. Mr. Bray, Warrior Crossing. Yes. Good are evening. You on a bouncy ball? Uh, Mayor and members of the council. Um, when I say evening, it really is, it, it's, it's almost good night. Uh, uh, but that's okay. Uh, the item before you tonight is related to the development of the northwest corner of Monta Vista and Kroll. Uh, that project will construct a coffee kiosk, as I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, as well as a multi-tenant commercial retail building. One of the conditions of approval for this project was the formation of an assessment district. Uh, and as you all know, assessment districts are created to fund the ongoing maintenance of public facilities associated with that specific project. On April 14th, uh, council approved the initial proceedings. And on April 28th, uh, this council approved the engineer's report. So tonight is the third and final step in this process. And this assessment district will fund the maintenance of street maintenance, street lighting, street trees, and storm drain facilities. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Bray? 
Okay, I'll open it to the public. Madam Clerk. Any member of the public would like to address the council regarding this item, please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine. Mayor, there are no members of the public that would like to address the council on this item. Thank you. Close the uh, public hearing. You sure? Bring it back. Okay, we got a motion. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh oh. I'm sorry. Prior to um, the motion and second, Mayor, I would just like to um, state that the only ballot received for this item is in oh, favor of you. the district, that no ballots were received in opposition of, therefore no majority protest exists, and the council may form the district. So now you can do your motion. Thank you. Thank you. I have a Good motion call. by council member Iscare, a second by council member Larson. Council member Ariano? Yes. Council member Larson? Yes. Councilmember Nizrati? Yes. Councilmember Scare? Yes. Mayor Bublack? Yes. It passes 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Bray. That was easy. All right, uh, council yep. items for future considerations. Yes. Can, can somebody come up with an idea, idea of how to keep my glasses from fogging up when I'm wearing the mask? Because this is, this is, look, see how, this is ridiculous. I've tried half a dozen different things. Maybe no glasses? Yes, yes, we got it. Mr. Wells, you got this? Chief, if I get that, I'm going to be walking in the walls. It's going to be worse than the fall. We'll give you a few more options. We'll get you a couple of different masks. So uh, one of the callers and then Mr. Bridegroom had sent you, all of us the uh, resolution. Um, so can you look into that and give us a timeline, Mr. Wells, on, on when we could see something like that? Is that something the council wants to consider? I, I don't know. look for council direction. I don't know if everyone received that or not. All it was mentioned started. on the call, but there was an email this afternoon on the, I think, similar. So it, it came to all of us. So can you address it then if so many people haven't read it uh, and get back to us? Sure. All right. Thank you for that. Any other items for future consideration? Can I, can I add one? Sure. Uh, I would like to see uh, my friend Gina Parker sent me uh, a Facebook post saying that the city of Merced was closing down Main Street on Thursdays and Friday nights so that the restaurants could open uh, with more customers and use utilizing the street. So I didn't know if that's something that we could do just maybe for the summer. I'm looking to that. Not, I mean, maybe just closing, you know, a one side one week and the other side the other week i don't know something to look into i'm i'm currently in conversation with businesses about doing something like that so i'm i'm yeah, i would request that councilman nasrati chat with Councilman yeah, yeah. ariano based on the conversation we've already had about some opportunities there worse of course coordinating with downtown and there's a bunch of moving parts there so the, the answer to the question is That'd be awesome. yes but uh i don't think we need an agenda item at this point there's yeah, well, a bunch of lay work that needs to be done before right. we have something ready for. I'll our connect with you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm curious if we can like open up to the public a little bit, twenty five percent or something. I I just feel like everybody else is being able to do it a little bit. So if we can, I, I mean, I. Oh, here. Well, the guidance as it stands today doesn't allow for that. Um, so is the Stanislaus County Board doing it? And well, their space is quite a bit different and I don't think they're ready to do it until did they go there today I didn't think they were quite I'm there. not sure I, I just they, heard that they, they had indicated it. they were going to go that route and then they backtracked based on the numbers okay. um, but I don't I haven't followed up with them but that's something yeah, we can get outdoor th that's more. the challenge right our are space we, is definitely limited here are we in question mode yet I couldn't hear sorry <laughs> Yeah, we'll continue to look into that. Okay. Anything else? Can I ask? Can I ask a question about that? Sure. If we are going to phase one in our EOC, and we continue to increase in numbers, phase one was a complete shutdown, right? So uh, you're talking about the EOC or the emergency response? Well, I, I'm just saying, because it kind of correlated. When we went to phase one with our EOC, we did have a complete 
shut down. So I'm, I, what I'm, well, maybe connecting the dots. If we still yeah. have an increase in yeah. numbers and we no, have our EOC at phase one, so two could, different things. I mean, the governor could pull back the reins quickly. Yeah. So they're but two different things. If we they're wear our mask and continue to flatline in our numbers, we wouldn't have to do that, correct? So you're, there, there's two different items here. The, the county EOC level of operation, meaning the uh, level of attention they're at, they're at the level one at the highest level. The um, right. phase of the COVID response that the governor has created, the four phases, that was a phase one. There was some correlation that we were in phase one at the same time we were at level one EOC response, but they aren't necessarily directly correlated um, with where we're at today. Okay, so we just we need to continue wearing our masks and social distancing. And wash your hands. And wash your hands. Okay. For how long? A long, long time. Oh my gosh! With hot water. Come on, guys. Okay, uh, council oh. member questions, comments, and announcements. A uh, question, Toby, um, on on that MOU. Just want to figure out now. I know it's coming up to agenda, but is it possible to share the MOU with the other council members, or is that still a Brown Act? Violation? So we need to have an agendized item. Um, it's not ready yet okay, for that. So keep it to part advance, so they can at least look it over before the. It agenda? needs to be a part of the agenda, okay. and I can work with um, Mr. White on uh, that process. But so MOU he's mentioned is the tran uh, opportunity for a transit MOU relative to a regional that is coming to council in the near future. Sure. So uh, last month I uh, was appointed co-chair and uh, put on the Stanislaus Act Homeless Action Committee. We had our first meeting. Uh, it was very productive. Um, it was just, uh, yeah, we, we started putting, laying the foundation as to what kinds of asks and uh, structure we're going to be putting in place to enable cities to work in a better way with the county to implement strategies. Um, I imagine that in the next month or two, there's going to be some sizable opportunities to to see see action here in Turlock. So I will keep you guys all informed, but the, it's, it's starting to move forward. And tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., because I know everybody wants to get up early, Smart and Final, don't Grand Opening, Ooh, Gear tell, Road. Don't tell my wife that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if somebody needs to have sharp objects at 7 a.m., but. All right, um, closed session, Mr. White. Yes, Mayor. Um, we have um, under item 13A, threats to, to public services or facilities under California Government Code 54957A. Okay, and uh, I, I was uh, 7 a.m. tomorrow for final, uh, Smart and Final is actually, I said gear, but I meant Golden State, just so don't go to the wrong place, people. Anyway, all right, we're going to uh, go into closed session. Thank you, everybody.
we're back from our closed session. Anything to report out? Thank you, Mayor. For the closed session item, council provided direction to staff, but no reportable action was taken. Okay, do we have a motion? Move to adjourn. Yeah, second. All in favor say? Aye. 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 Aye.